A hearing now with the head of the Government Services Administration, Loretta Doan. A recent report was critical of her involvement in a meeting where she allegedly encouraged federal officials to help Republican candidates. Henry Waxman chairs this three-hour House Government Oversight Committee hearing. The meeting of the committee will come to order. This hearing of the House Oversight Committee uh, wants to welcome our witness, Loretta A. Doan, the Administrator of the General Services Administration. This hearing is not being held to reinvestigate Ms. Doan's violations of the Hatch Act. Our hearing on March 28th and the subsequent investigation by the Office of Special Counsel provide an ample record to assess Ms. Doan's compliance with this important law. This hearing will focus on other issues. First, there are serious questions whether Ms. Doan testified truthfully during our first hearing. And there are also new allegations that Ms. Doan tried to intimidate and retaliate against federal employees who cooperated with this committee's investigation. Both issues should be of great concern to all members of our committee. When our committee learned earlier this year <clears throat> that Ms. Doan may have violated the Federal Hatch Act by asking GSA political appointees how they could help our Republican candidates in upcoming elections, we appropriately initiated an investigation. As part of this investigation, six GSA political appointees were asked to give transcribed interviews or depositions to this committee. All six agreed to come before the committee voluntarily, and all six told us about a political pre presentation at GSA headquarters in January by Scott Jennings, Carl Rove's uh, de deputy, uh, uh, at the White House. During that presentation, Mr. Jennings identified 20 Democratic members as targets in 2008. According to all six employees, Ms. Stone then asked the GSA political appointees gathered for the presentation, how could they help our candidates in the upcoming elections? It was not easy for these GSA employees to come before our committee. Like Ms. Doan, they too were Republicans. They were political appointees. And they knew their statements would be evidence that their boss violated the Hatch Act. And like all employees, they must have feared the potential consequences. But they knew that they had an obligation to tell the truth, and they did. As a result of the committee's investigation and hearing, we determined conclusively, in my opinion, that Ms. Doan solicited her employees at GSA to engage in partisan political activity on government property, a clear violation of the Federal Hatch Act. After the March 28th hearing, the Office of Special Counsel, which enforces the Hatch Act, interviewed Ms. Doan about her conduct. When Ms. Doan was asked about the six, G six GSA officials who cooperated with this committee's investigation, this is what Ms. Doan told the Special Counsel, quote, there's not a single one of those who did not have somewhere in between a poor to totally inferior performance, end quote. In her written testimony, Ms. Doan says that she thought her remarks were going to be treated confidentially by the Office of Special Counsel. In fact, she blames the Special Counsel for victimizing the employees by disclosing her disparaging comments. Well, there are just two problems with Ms. Doan's position. First, her statements about her GSA colleagues appear to be false. Ms. Doan refused to provide the employees personal rec records to this committee. But the Office of Special Counsel did review the employment records and found that all the employees had satisfactory or better performance. It is wrong for a federal agency head 
to make false or misleading accusations against Federal employees. It does not matter whether the official expects confidentiality or not. Unsubstantiated accusations are always wrong. Second, Ms. Doan did, didn't just disparage the employees. Under oath, she told the special counsel, and again I quote, until extensive rehabilitation of their performance occurs, they will not be getting promoted and will not be getting bonuses or special awards or anything of that nature, end quote. Apparently, Ms. Doan's position is that it is fine for her to retaliate against her employees by denying them promotions, bonuses, and awards so long as she does so in secret and no one knows about it. Well, I think she's wrong. And so long as I'm chairman of this committee, we're not going to look the other way when there is credible evidence that Federal officials are threatening their employees, especially when these employees are being threatened for participating and volunteering information to the Congress of the United States. We passed, I think unanimously, a Whistleblower Protection Act because we value Federal employees being able to come forward without fear of retaliation so that we can learn about what's going on in Federal agencies when they misuse their power in those agencies, when they abuse the taxpayers' trust, when they waste taxpayers' dollars. Well, our committee has a fundamental obligation to stand up for Federal employees who cooperate with investigators and tell us the truth. And we have an equal obligation, indeed a moral responsibility, to investigate and hold Federal officials to account if they threaten to withhold bonuses and deny promotions to employees who tell the truth to the Congress. I'm amazed that anyone would think we shouldn't do that. I'm equally amazed that a few members apparently don't believe it matters very much whether Ms. Doan testified truthfully during her March 28 hearing. I've even heard some members say, so what if she did political activity at, on government property? What's the big deal? Well, violating the Hatch Act is a big deal. Fortunately, most members of this committee want to get to the truth, want to make sure that Federal employees don't face threats when they act with integrity and honesty, and that's what this hearing is about. And I look forward to hearing more today from Ms. Doan. I'm going to recognize um, the ranking member of this committee, Mr. Davis. He will not have any other opening statements. Uh, I want to try out something new for our committee's deliberation. Mr. Uh, Davis, as the ranking member, will have a, a bank of 10 minutes time to control during the process of the questioning to either use or yield to his members. We will have a, another bank of 10 minutes and we will be able to use it or yield it to um, different of our colleagues rather, uh, rather interspersed in the ordinary uh, proceedings of the committee. Uh, to start the questioning, we are going to do a round of 10 minutes on each side. Uh, Mr. Davis, I want to recognize you for your statement. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with all due respect, I can't for the life of me figure out what we are doing here this morning. The committee and its many subcommittees held just one hearing this week, and this is the topic we have chosen. Somehow we have lost track of the good government agenda that we pledged to pursue. Maybe that is one of the reasons the Los Angeles Times yesterday showed Congress with low ratings in the administration. For the first time, the Speaker's number is higher, unfavorable than favorable. The majority says they are concerned about retaliation against government officials who have cooperated with investigators. But no such retaliation ever occurred. The real retaliation here is against an entrepreneurial African-American woman who, stop the presses, supports the administration that appointed her and is paying the price for trying to make her organization a better, more efficient and effective place. Today's hearing is a gross misuse of committee resources built on an unprofessional and seemingly preordained report from the Office of Special Counsel. It is a farce premised on a sham. There are so many flaws and injustices and fabrications here, I hardly know where to begin. But let me reel off just a few. Administrator Doan was obligated to cooperate with investigators when she made the comments the Chairman just described. 
She didn't come forward and volunteer. She was obligated to answer these questions. She was compelled to say what she believed under oath, and she did so after assurances of confidentiality were given to her by the Office of Special Counsel Lawyers. Nevertheless, before the Administrator had a chance to respond to the OSC report, a draft version was given to the Washington Post, a version that only OSC possessed and only the Office of Special Counsel could have leaked. I think it is preposterous that we are again inserting ourselves into unfinished proceedings, this time an unfinished Office of Special Counsel matter. Under the rules, the Office of Special Counsel makes the recommendation to the White House, and the White House responds, and here we are in the middle of this. But if that is our choice, then our time would be far better spent looking at the unfair investigation OSC conducted and the special legal reasoning in the OSC report. Loretta Doan was not afforded basic due process rights, such as an opportunity to review the testimony submitted against her. Never saw it. Until this week, she was denied access to the transcript of her own testimony, 10 hours of testimony to OSC investigators to prepare for this hearing. The Office of Special Counsel report is remarkably harsh and hyperbolic and extremely short on support. The report really cites no evidence. There are not footnotes, no exhibits. They simply say that they interviewed over 20 individuals at attendance at the Jennings presentation. But the report quotes testimony from zero attendees. Why didn't they talk to all the attendees? How did they choose which ones to talk to and which ones not to? The shoddy evidentiary support is reflected in the report's Hatch Act analysis. The report fails to identify a single election or candidate that Administrator Doan sought to assist, because there were none. In fact, there was no election going on. The, re the report asserts without any analysis or finding that her statement, how can we help our candidates, solicited or directed employees to engage in partisan political activity. This was a question that she asked. I am sure in retrospect wishes she hadn't, but she just asked, all right, you have given us this presentation. How do we help our candidates? It could have been ringing doorbells. It could have been making phone calls after hours at phone banks. No effort here to say how do we use the agency to help our candidates. No allegations that that happened. No statements that that happened. Just hi hyperbole and uh, in interpretation from the other side and from the Office of Special Counsel. Not one employee responded with any proposal to help any candidate on any election, so it never happened. How then is her question in itself a solicitation? What if the question was heard to mean, what can we do to legally help our candidates? Does that change it? A 2002 opinion by the same Office of Special Counsel advised, the Hatch Act does not purport to prohibit all discourse by Federal employees on political subjects or candidates in a Federal building or while on duty. Yet Administrator Doan's offhand comment, without any follow-up action, is found to be a solicitation. By that standard, saying God bless America at work could be a violation of the Establishment Clause. It is clear the Office of Special Counsel recognized they were short on evidence, so they resorted instead to absurd hyperbole. They said, quote, one can imagine no greater violation of the Hatch Act, the report reads. Well, I can. OSC clearly lacks any imagination. How about an employee who actually uses a government email system to send campaign materials, something the MSPB considered this past December in Special Counsel versus Wilkinson? Or what about making fundraising calls from the office of the Vice President? And this actually happened. In this OSC report, we are left only with pejorative adjectives like pernicious without any nouns, in other words, facts, to support sweeping legal conclusions. No cases cited, no controlling legal authority relied on. I think the majority recognizes how tenuous the Hatch Act case is as well. They realize that we are witnessing is an Office of Special Counsel eager to rehabilitate and vindicate itself. And they realize the other issues that originally brought Administrator Doan a summons from the committee Remember, it wasn't that long ago we were talking about a Federal Supply Schedule contract held by Sun Microsystems, the suspension and debarment process, and contemplated contract with a diversity consulting company. But those issues bore no political fruit. So here we are, they're dropped, and here we're back again looking at something else. But the Hatch Act, how juicy, how convenient. What a short hop, skip, and a jump to the office of Karl Rove. I'm just not buying the alleged premise of today's hearing. No one is more concerned than I am about protecting the institutional integrity of this committee and the ability of witnesses to give us the information we need without reprisal. But that is not why we are here today. After all, if the majority were so concerned about the integrity of testimony before the committee, there are other witnesses who should appear to explain their testimony. 
Valerie Plame Wilson's sworn statements to this committee are irreconcilably inconsistent with her statements to the CIA Inspector General and the Senate Intelligence Committee. She told the Senate Committee, I honestly do not recall if I suggested if her husband, uh, if, if, if she suggested her husband to go over to Nigeria. She told us, I did not recommend him, I did not suggest him, and another officer suggested him, suggested that we send Joe Wilson. She testified that the uncontested additional views of three Senators on the, S on the uh, Senate Committee stating that she suggested Wilson is incorrect, but her own memorandum, her own emails, said uh, on uh, February 12th, her email to the Chief of the CIA says, I am hesitant to suggest anything again. However, my husband may be in a position to assist. Therefore, I request your thought on what, if anything, to pursue here. Question, whether an inquiry from the Office of the Vice President prompted Plame to suggest or recommend Wilson. She told us she had just received a telephone call on, on February, she wrote her February 12th email after her conversation with a junior officer had just received a telephone call on her desk from someone I don't know who in the Office of the Vice President. But her own memorandum and other documents, the next day uh, it wasn't until the CIA, uh, the Vice President CIA briefer said the VP was shown an assessment that Iraq is purchasing uranium from Africa and he would like CIA's assessment of the transaction. That didn't happen until the next day. Next question, uh, whether a conversation with her branch chief and a colleague prompted Plame to write her February 12th email. She testified before this committee, as I was leaving my branch office chief asked me to draft a quick email to the chief of our counterproliferation division to let him know that this might happen. But in her own memorandum, February 12th, uh, she notes that the report forward below was prompted me to send this to you. That wasn't that. So there are many inconsistencies there. But I doubt seriously this committee will look at those. The GSA Inspector General testified before this committee that he relied on information from the majority's website to support a key finding in his earlier report on the GSA Administrator. The legitimacy of the committee's work is at stake if we do not question the testimony of those witnesses. I am concerned the committee is becoming a place where witnesses can testify with impunity so long as they say whatever fits the Democrats' political agenda. I think we also need to carefully consider the undue influence this committee and attendant media reports and leaks have on the OSC proceedings against Administrator Doan. During their questioning of the Administrator, OSC's own lawyers acknowledged the committee's previous hearings tainted their proceedings as it became impossible to determine whether witnesses were influenced by press coverage of that hearing. Finally, Mr. Chairman, you say we are here to protect Federal employees, then why are we demanding personnel files and giving further air time to what the Administrator said about GSA employees? She said it in a private venue after assurances that these wouldn't be released and their reputations wouldn't be tarnished or aired. Why are we meeting in public? Remember, Administrator Doan thought her testimony would remain confidential. It is only through the Office of Special Counsel media leaks and your hearings today that these employees are being damaged. The truth is, I think the Administrator's testimony before us in March could have been stronger. She could have been better prepared. I think she could have chosen her words to the OSC more carefully, I think, on reflection she would agree with me. But I think that the committee and the OSC are guilty of grossly overplaying their hands in response to her inelegant truthfulness uh, and good faith. I urge you to refocus the committee's time and resources on the countless issues demanding our attention. Real ID implementation, information security, border control, emergency preparedness in the nation's capital, security clearance backlogs. The list goes on and on. And I would ask you, Mr. Chairman, uh, th that you uh, issue a subpoena to Valerie Plame Wilson. Ms. Plame Wilson should be summoned to appear before this committee and address the substantial irregularities in her sworn testimony. As I have outlined out here, uh, before the Senate panel and before our committee, there appear to be irreconcilable inconsistencies in numerous respects that go to the heart of your investigation. You want to bring the Secretary of State before this committee and take time from her busy travel schedule. We ought to address these as well. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, certainly points that I would want to debate with you, but I think we ought to move on to hear from our witness, and a lot of the uh, arguments will come out in the questioning by the members. Mr. Chairman? I, yes. We, 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 uh, other members will not have a chance at this No, we are going to go right to our witnesses. All members will get five minutes uh, for well, questioning Mr. Chairman, the witnesses. Chairman, let me make I'm, a I am very sorry about that. I, I think there is some uh, uh, additional illuminating that could be done at this point, but I will wait for my five well, minutes later. Mr. Chairman, let me just ask this. We got members here. Maybe we can get it through. I, I would move the committee uh, direct the chairman to issue a subpoena to Valerie Plain Wilson. 
You're she making a motion? I am. Uh, she should be summoned to appear before this committee and address the irregularities in her sworn testimony. Well, I'd be happy to discuss this with you, and I don't want to issue a subpoena and before we invite a witness. She did come here voluntarily, and if there are questions we want to ask of her and you feel you need an answer, I'll work with you to get the answers. All right. All right. Uh, I'd like to now call forward uh, Loretta Doan, head of the General Services Administration. Before you even sit down, Ms. Doan, uh, I think you know it's the practice of this committee to uh, ask all witnesses that appear before us to take an oath, and I'd like you to sta continue standing and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Before she's here, the Mr. record will reflect. Yes, yes, I accept you at your word. Withdraw, withdraw my motion. We have a relationship, and we will discuss this uh, uh, and how we can get the bottom. Then I accept Thank you, you at your word. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Uh, we welcome you back to the committee, and I'm going to let you proceed however you see fit. There's a button on the base of the mic, which you need to press in and pull it close enough to you so that it can get all picked up. Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee. In 1989, I took a job that no other company was willing to do. My task was to upgrade a computer system in Berlin, Germany. But when I got to Berlin, it was the day the wall came down and the city went nuts. And like most Berliners that day, I rented a hammer and a chisel, and I did my little part to chip away at the Berlin Wall. Today, I find myself in a similar situation where I am caught in the midst of something much bigger than I am with very far-reaching ramifications. Ms. Dunn, could you pull the mic a little closer? Would Can you not hear me? I'm, I'm there, that's good. As administrator of GSA, I've been a tireless advocate for GSA and have done the best that I can to champion efforts to remove obstacles to performance, promote greater entrepreneurism, and provide more support to our beleaguered federal contracting community. I am human and imperfect, and I make mistakes. But when it comes to GSA, my heart is in the trim. As I testified earlier, the results of this past year have been spectacular. We regained our clean audit, saved millions of taxpayer dollars, stood up a new Office of Emergency Response and Recovery to better help in disasters, rekindled entrepreneurial energies, restored the confidence of our two largest customers, reduced the time to award contracts by three months, successfully executed the largest reorganization in the history of GSA, launched a government-wide acquisition contract to provide people who have sacrificed so much for our country, our nation's service-disabled veterans, with more opportunities to do business with the federal government. GSA is focused on results, and we were recently voted by employees as one of the best places to work in federal government. And these are only a few of our achievements achievements that have at times been overshadowed by allegations against me. In instances, the allegations have simply been untrue. In others, I made mistakes and I said so. In still others, the allegations have been presented, have not been presented in fair, accurate, or even complete context. Since my first days as administrator, I have said that there is no greater asset than the GSA employees. However, the leak of the Office of Special Counsel's report has had serious consequences for people other than me, and it will have an impact on my testimony here today. My answers to investigative questions regarding employee performances were made with the expectation that identifying information about those discussed was to be treated confidentially and because I wanted to be fully cooperative with the investigation team. I never intended or imagine that this information would be carelessly made public by others, and I sincerely regret any intended consequences that may have resulted. It is so very sad that people, good people, who have decided to devote some part of their life to serving this country have had to undergo a public discussion of their performance for no good reason. It is, however, important to note that these performance evaluations occurred prior to the January 26th meeting and I would appreciate the committee's understanding and agreement on this very point. Sadly, though, as I see it, 
at no time has anyone on the majority staff asked me questions about GSA's accomplishments. The nature of the questions since that hearing and the overwhelming majority of the questions that I got in person last time seem more like a game of political gotcha, with me being the gotcha. I do not wish in any way to suggest that I have not made mistakes. I have. More to the point, I am likely to make more. But my point here is something more important. The culture of gotcha is inherently corrosive. Any words or even the hint of something even slightly controversial is seized upon, magnified, and used to inflict as much personal harm as possible. More than anything else, actions and facts are minimized in favor of sensationalism. It is frustrating to be accused of playing politics at GSA when I know that my decisions have been based on merit. Several of my key political appointees were actually career employees because I just wanted the best person for the position. More importantly, GSA procurements are determined by the priorities of its government customers, not partisan politics. You may fault me for not remembering and you may find fault with how I responded to one or two hypothetical questions posed during the course of a nine-hour interrogation about that event. Even if you were to do that, and I feel certain that some of you will be doing that this morning, you will not be as hard on me as I have been on myself. But none of my actions, however, have been intended or have resulted in personal or partisan political gain. I grew up in the Ninth Ward in New Orleans, and being one of the first minority students in an all-white school taught me a lot about how to deal with unfairness, with harassment, and with hostile environments. And it taught me that you don't quit just because things get tough, because quitting would be far worse than persevering in the face of adversity. So today I sit before you prepared to answer your questions to the fullest extent I can with honesty and with transparency, and I hope to bring clarity by explaining the context in which many of my comments were made. But there are certain things that I would prefer not to do this morning. First, I will be happy to answer general questions about policies and procedures, but the privacy rights of GSA employees is too important for me to be goaded into a discussion of any individual's performances unless it is to praise them for outstanding work. I'm a firm believer in the old adage, praise in public, criticize in private. Second, I will not try to make legal arguments because, quite simply, I'm not a lawyer. The letter my attorney wrote in response to the White House Special Counsel speaks for itself. Finally, I will not put blame on others. I will, to the extent possible, be open and as candid as I know how to be. What I learned in Berlin in 1989 is that change is difficult. My first whack at the Berlin Wall had no effect at all, and my second swing of the hammer, when I did that, I hit my thumb, and it really hurt. But I kept at it. I did not let mistakes or errors prevent me from accomplishing my goal, and while it may have taken more than 40 or 50 swings, I did finally break off a piece of that wall. I am grateful for this opportunity to serve, and I am excited about the successes GSA has had. We have built a strong team of both career and non-career employees, and I believe that we are laying the groundwork for a successful future for this generation of GSA employees. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee, I hope my appearance here today will answer fully any questions you might have and will set the record straight. Great things are happening at GSA, and the nation can and should be proud of what is being accomplished. The chips are flying. Change is happening, even if the administrator occasionally hits her thumb. Thank you very much, Ms. Stone. I want to start off our questioning by commenting on the fact that if you listen to the Republican arguments as articulated by the ranking member, this is all a partisan activity. You're Republican, the majority is Democrat. But Ms. Stone's problem started with her, ins with her uh, inspector general appointed by President Bush. She said he was out to get her. The next thing that happened was that uh, there was an office of a uh, special prosecutor that investigated Ms. Stone and found that she had violated the Hatch Act. 
that special prosecutor, or Office of Special Counsel, was appointed by President Bush. It is not a democratic uh, organization. It's a governmental organization. They're supposed to enforce the Hatch Act. Thirdly, the criticisms, people say, are coming from Democrats. But one of the first people to speak out about the problems at GSA, particularly the sweetheart contracts that we were seeing let out at GSA that raised questions, was Senator Grassley, the lead Republican on the Senate Finance Committee, a vel very well-respected man on both sides of the aisle, but a Republican. And then we've heard, not only is it all of this partisan, other people have done worse. Oh, Valerie Plame, she lied. Richard Nixon, he lied. Other people have done worse. They could have been calling directly for contributions. Well, certainly people have done bad things. And some have violated the Hatch Act in ways that are even more troubling. But that doesn't mean that Ms. Stone's conduct by having and hosting a political briefing to Republican political appointees, urging them to help our Republican candidates was not a problem under the Hatch Act, which is supposed to protect employees from their supervisors imposing their politics on them. Now, the problem with these, uh, these um, people that were criticized by Ms. Doan were that they testified before this committee, and that get, got her wrath. But as I pointed out, those people as well were Republicans. Some of them were Republican appointees at the GSA. Let's look at the facts of this case and determine whether we have a problem here or not of intimidating federal employees. I want to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Braley from Iowa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Stone, it's good to have you back. I'd like to start by taking you back to May 31st of 2006, which I'm sure was a memorable day in your life. Do you remember that day? Uh, yes, it was the day I was sworn in as administrator of the General Services Administration in the afternoon at the GSA Auditorium. That's correct. And do you remember the remarks you shared as part of your appointment that day? In general, but if you would care to share with me the specifics that you want to discuss, I'm happy to well, hear Well, one of the comments you made <clears throat> during your Oath of Office ceremony speech was that the administrator of GSA is an important position of trust, and I value the co President's confidence in me. Do you remember that statement? I believe I would. I'm sure you got that off the website. I'm happy to agree with you on that. Then you talked about some of the goals that you had set for the agency, and the first goal you mentioned was returning to President Truman's vision for GSA, a clean, honest, and responsive purchasing agency. Do you remember outlining that goal? Yes. The reason we find ourselves back here today is to determine whether you violated your position of trust by engaging in retaliation against the very government officials who cooperated with the investigators looking into the allegations of improper conduct by you. And you made reference to the fact that in your uh, statement, which you shared with the committee today, you indicated there is no greater asset at GSA than its employee. That's something that you believe in. And I've spoken firmly and acted firmly in that area. Well, you testified before the committee on March 28th, and I asked you about a political presentation by Karl Rove's deputy, Scott Jennings, that was hosted at the GSA headquarters. And we went through the various PowerPoint slides that had been presented by Mr. Jennings talking about the plans to defend Republican seats and defeat Democrats in 2008. And this committee was concerned because to us it appeared that those presentations violated the Hatch Act, which prohibits political activity on government pro property. And then since then, we have learned that the White House gave similar presentations throughout federal government agencies. But when I asked you about that presentation, you claimed to have no recollection of it whatsoever. Other GSA employees did remember that presentation, however, and they also remembered how you followed up by asking your employees how you could get GSA to help our candidates, meaning Republican candidates in upcoming elections. When I asked you about this statement, you again claimed to have no recollection. 
So finally, I asked you about the GSA employees who cooperated with our investigation. All of them told us that you made this statement. When I asked you whether you had any reason to doubt their memory or the credibility of these GSA officials, your answer was no, you did not because you could not remember the event. Do you remember that discussion we had? I remember the discussion, maybe not the exact give and take of it. Those were your answers on March 28th, but after that hearing you testified again before the Office of Special Counsel, and there you gave a very different story. We have the transcript here from your testimony, and it shows that you said that these GSA officials were poor for performers, you questioned their memories, and you even suggested that they were not telling the truth to federal investigators. These are extremely serious charges against your colleagues, and we want you to explain them. Let me put up your testimony, if we have that. You stated, and I quote, there's not a single one of those who did not have somewhere in between a poor to totally inferior performance. So you testified that each of the GSA employees who spoke to the Office of Special Counsel had poor to totally inferior performance. Isn't that true? I think what is important to understand is the context in which the question was asked to me. I they think asked it's important for you to answer the question. Isn't that true? I am trying, true? Congressman Braley, to answer it to the fullest of the ability, and that is you have to understand the context in which the Office of Special Counsel Investigator asked me, could I please speculate on what and why there might be a difference in the recollections of the events of January 26. And I tried to comply as fully and as candidly as I possibly could with their request. And that is the context. And they asked me to speculate, and I did. Well, and I, I, doubt, I, I should I not doubt, have. I doubt very seriously whether this transcript would indicate that the Office of Special Counsel would ask you to speculate on anything. And this committee certainly doesn't want you to speculate. We want you to testify about facts. And my question to you was, isn't it true that you testified that each of these GSA employees who spoke to the Office of Special Counsel had poured a totally inferior performance? That's a yes or no answer. I appreciate you giving me the chance. First things first, if you would Turn your attention to Bates number 385. You will see that indeed the Office of Special Counsel did ask me to speculate. Their exact thing is, statement is, I'm asking you to speculate. Now, this is at the end of nine hours of questioning. If we were to go to the first 20 minutes, we'd also find that they asked me to speculate. Now, I started tallying up how many times they asked me to speculate throughout it, and actually I decided this was not time well spent because there were so many opportunities where they asked me to speculate. Was I wrong to speculate? Absolutely. I should not have done this. We should have focused on facts. Um, the Office of Special Counsel, even if they asked me to speculate, I have to tell you, I really regret doing that. I should not have done that. That was not right of me. Um, I did it because I was trying to be compliant, and I thought that it was going to be fully confidential, well, but I regret they asked doing you it. After that preface that you read to us was, do you think anyone at this meeting would have made would it make up that you had made these statements? That was the context of the question. Yes, it was. And if you look at my response, which follows it, you'll see that I did not say that they made it up. What I said is I think it's possible that if a leading question were asked, yes, I think one or two of them may not wish me well, but what we had been talking about for about maybe 20 pages beforehand was the fact that before any of these uh, folks were questioned by any of the different investigators. There had been repeated news articles. It had been in all the trade rags and trade, I'm sorry, trade journals. And in addition to that, they had been um, investigated or whatever you call it, um, interviewed by you guys on the committee. And so what I had said is that there is the possibility that there were lots of opportunities for them to hear information and if someone were then in that context to then be asking a leading question, it's possible that recollections change. I cannot say whether someone misspoke or not. I can only talk about myself, and I cannot account for changes in other people's recollection. That's the context that I was trying to explain, Congressman. Were you Mr. Braley, I'm going to yield you three additional minutes. Were you represented by counsel at this hearing? I'm sorry, what? Were you represented by counsel during this interview? Oh, during the interview. Um, I had uh, my general counsel, uh, not my general counsel, I had my personal counsel with me. 
Did anybody sitting. raise an objection to the question when it was posed during the interview? Well, I think when we start going no, back. In this specific question, did anybody raise an objection? Uh, Congressman Braley, no, because in the first hour of the interview, we got into a little bit of a spat because it was perceived that I wasn't complying fully when I tried to um, give yes and no and avoid uh, these kinds of issues. And so in an attempt to try to be more forthcoming, to show that I was fully open and was trying to comply with the investigation no matter how wild the questions were. And I will say, some of these questions got pretty wild. Well, let's um, talk I about tried to com questions. I tried to comply. I don't have comply. that much time, so I'm going to move on to another okay. question. You also made the statement that impugned these officials when you said, I do find it highly disturbing that some of the most vocal proponents or the most articulate speaking out against me are also the people I've either moved on or they are, I don't want to say permanently demoted, but they're kind of until extensive rehabilitation of their performance occurs, they will not be getting promoted and will not be getting bonuses or special awards or anything of that nature. So in addition to being poor or totally inferior, they're now not going to be getting bonuses, promotions or awards. And those are very harsh attacks, don't you agree? First. There can be no retaliation given that performance reviews were performed well in advance of the January 26th meeting. The two events cannot possibly co be connected. The Office of Special Counsel's report is filled with leaps in logic because how can you have performance reviews that happen any time between September and December, early January, an event, a brown bag lunch that happens January 26th, and then claim that a performance review which was given a month before was in retaliation for an event which happens a month and a half later. It simply one, is not possible. You were the one raising concerns about the performance of the witnesses who testified against you, and you were given an opportunity to present evidence to the Office of Special Counsel to back up your claims. They reviewed the evidence you provided and still concluded that your statements were unwarranted in their report to the President. Isn't that true? No, that is not correct, Congressman Braley. The, actually, the first um, request to talk about performance came from the investigators, and the investigators themselves um, actually asked me would I talk about the performance. If we, this is when I said that the, uh, the discussion covered a whole wild set of stuff. That was on day one. I think you've been focusing only on day two. Mr. Braley, uh, you only have 14 seconds left. I want to reclaim my time. Ms. 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 Stone. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm losing. Ms. Stone, I, I'm going to make a rhetorical statement because when we first heard from you, you claimed that you were being picked on by your Inspector General Brian Miller, a Republican appointee. Then you said you're being picked on by the Office of Special Counsel. Then you said you're being picked on by these employees. Can you think that your statements about those employees reflected anything other than anger at them and a desire to make sure that they don't get promotions because of what they did to you? Congressman uh, Waxman, Chairman Waxman, if you could actually point out to me my language in my previous testimony where I said that the IG was picking on me, I, I just don't believe I said that. I, I just find that hard to believe. You said who's going to investigate the investigators? No, that's something totally different. And if you could still um, point me out to the exact quotation, I'd like to be able to understand the context and what was said. I, I still don't remember. Uh, making that exact phrase, and I do think the exact wording, if we're going to be talking about this, is important. Could you please? Um, maybe well, my time has expired. I'm going to oh, okay. go on to Mr. Davis, and we'll see if we can give you the, the language. But with your sharp memory, uh, you, you may have me uh, you have, you have me uh, questioning whether I got read it right, but I'll get it for you. Mr. Okay, Chairman. Thank you. I appreciate Mr. That. Chairman, par parliamentary inquiry. A gentleman, state is parliamentary um, inquiry. Mr. Chairman. Um, we had a GSA administrator in previously, and we had questions that were, have been raised about her, her alleged violation of the uh, Hatch Act. And uh, at that time, we what were is your parliament to What the is your office. parliamentary inquiry? Well, I, I have to lead up to this because. Well, I'm sorry that I well, don't okay, hear a parliamentary right. inquiry. My parliamentary inquiry, sir, is that. Uh, there was a leak of information to the Washington Post relating to the special counsel's draft report, which was either leaked by the Office of Special Counsel uh, or by a staffer from this committee. And I would like 
to ask when it would be parliamentary Gentlemen. appropriate to ask for the resignation of either the special counsel or the individual on this staff that leaked to the Washington Post uh, a copy of the special counsel draft report and I would like this made part of the record now, this story that appeared on yeah, the The gentleman is not stating a parliamentary inquiry, but you will, you will have an opportunity. Correction. In fact, you just took an opportunity. You can ask for the resignation of the uh, Office of Speci er, uh, Special Counsel. You ought to check because he is when a Republican it, when it would be appointee. Sir, to when your time for comes, resignation when of your time comes for questioning, but it's of Mr. This, of this committee, if they leak that information. Thank you. The gentleman is out of order, and, I, and the gentleman and would, uh, from Virginia, Mr. Davis, that we objection is heard. The record, a copy I'm sorry, at objection. This point, I'll yield to you. Uh, Mr. Davis is now recognized Thank on you. his time, and he can yield to you, and that's I'll, certainly I'll yield the gentleman 30 seconds to put anything in the record. Well, I, I would like uh, unanimous consent. I, I have been on this committee for 15 years. I have never seen an inve investigation conducted in this manner. This is a three ring circus. The, That's the what you said in our last read, investigation. The morning I read this, it was it was appalling to me to have to have leaked to the Washington Post. Then the next day, and I'd like to ask unanimous uh, consent that the article, the 23rd of May, be inserted in the record. Then the correction, With, without objection, the correction that, would, that we without should, object, that people the gentleman will uh, allow. I would also like the correction. The gentleman wants it in the record. Yes. Right. Without objection, it will be uh, put into the record. The correction. Uh, thank you. And then I would also like at some point to offer a motion to have an investigation of uh, either the staff or special counsel okay. to find out who right. leaked this information in this, in, in this investigation, which we're taking very seriously in this committee. Someone leaked that information before even Ms. Ms. Doan had that information. Mr. I have never seen the thank conduct you. of an investigation thank in you. 15 years. Uh, proceed in right. this manner, and I want an investigation of either the Office of Special Counsel by this committee or the staffer, and I want the resignations of those individuals, okay. and I will pursue this. Well, the gentleman yield. I, I do want to inform him that we uh, did not see the uh, draft of the Special Counsel's report until it appeared in the newspaper. Our staff did not have it. It was that, prepared that by the Office of Special Counsel. That, sir, is appalling. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me uh, take a couple, just to correct a couple things. Um, I don't believe that th there is any allegation, as I read the Office of Special Investigators report, that you were urging GSA to help our candidates. I think the questions, and they were leading questions that were asked by committee staff, uh, were majority staff, were how can we help our candidates, not how can we use GSA to help our candidates, uh, Mrs. Doan. But let me just ask this, did GSA do anything to help the candidates? No, GSA is not a partisan agency. Have, uh, uh, to your knowledge, has GSA done anything to advance uh, the candidates following that presentation by the White House? No, that's not GSA's mission. Okay. So asking a question, how can we help our candidates in response to a presentation the White House foisted on you wasn't an advocacy. He was just saying, all right, you've given us this presentation. What are we supposed to do, basically? Is that correct? I don't remember actually making the statement, but I understand what you're trying to say, okay. and that would be true. All right, that's, that's fine. Um, the, uh, did you ever urge any of the people who were at that meeting to go out and help the candidates, or did you simply ask the White House, what can we do to help? Do you remember that at well, all? Of course I wouldn't urge any GSA employee to go out thank and help you, thank candidates. Thank you. Um, was any federal employee retaliated against? No, I do not believe anyone was, and in fact, the meeting happened months after performance evaluations were performed. Now, there's been a lot made on these performance evaluations. Could you explain to us uh, wh how the evaluations work? They're graded one through five, is that correct? Yes, we have a system one through five. And, and without getting into specifics, there were several employees there who had uh, talked to investigators who had recalled uh, comments that they claim you made something. They weren't clear on what they made. They were answered leading questions. Um, but is, isn't it the case that in some of these cases the employees receive threes? That's true. And that means what? Three means no bonus. It means no bonus, but it is stated as what? Not a poor performance, but... It meets expectations. But meets expectations is a, a three is a critical um, uh, score because it means you don't qualify for the bonus, correct? You do, with a three you get no bonus. 
and an employee that gets a score who, who doesn't get a bonus may feel this was a speculative answer, as I understand, right? Is that you're answering a speculative question? Yes, and I'm trying to learn from experience and not speculate yeah, anymore. But, but in that case, an employee who receives a three may feel, you know, I don't know that they did or didn't, but they may feel I deserved a bonus, I didn't get one, and uh, That's very possible. Uh, they, they may feel uh, ap ap appropriately uh, uh, not good about that valuation. And employees also compare themselves to their peers, and that's important too. And they compare themselves to the rating they got perhaps the year before or six months before. All of these things go into an employee's perception of, of the performance. Now, of when you made these comments, you felt, am I correct, that you had assurances that this was going to stay confidential. You didn't volunteer this. They asked you specifically. Uh, I specifically what, asked them, and they specifically said that they do not release the transcripts under any circumstances, and obviously that wasn't had, true. Had you known that employees' names were going to be released in public, would you have even answered the question? No way. Okay. So in no way were you trying to smear anybody or disparage anyone's uh, reputation. This basically came uh, the names were released by the Office of Special Counsel or someone else in a leak because you didn't even have uh, possession of these uh, uh, of the testimony. Is that correct? Yes, it's worse. They deliberately it appears they went out of their way to embarrass the employees. I got it online also, but the original draft version called everyone employee A, B, and C. Someone went out of their way to reinsert employees' names into a final version of the document. Why would someone choose to do that? And 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 cause embarrassment to young people who are just serving their country and, and doing public service. I do not know. So in the uh, original draft, they didn't put the names in, uh, but in the final draft, they did put the names in and leaked it. And leak it. And why would you do that? That's well, so that's wrong. Well, that's a good question. That's a question we'll have to ask the uh, uh, the Office of Special Counsel, and I hope that we will uh, we will pursue that. Um, the Office of Special Counsel said at pages 400 and 401 of your deposition transcript, uh, the second thing I think is uh, what you both have been commenting on throughout this process if, is we interviewed as many people as we possibly could before the hearing, and then as soon as the hearing became public and it was known to the employees how the administrator would testify, we were concerned about employees feeling that having some concerns if they didn't substantiate the testimony of the administrator, and that's why we were extremely disciplined, extremely and Mrs. Vale says, no, I imagine that a number of individuals watched your hearing, and one of our concerns all along was people's memories are getting tainted by the discussions that are being held in GSA and by the news media and obviously by any testimony that's been made. Um, basically, OS, my understanding is that OSC's uh, interviews were tainted by the fact that uh, they had, this had already been in the public domain, they read it in the paper, they may not have remembered what happened originally but seeing an allegation in the paper then kind of refreshes their uh, recollection, maybe rightly uh, or um, uh, wrongly. Um, the questioning by the majority staff on this, several witnesses have told they, they, here's one of their questions. Several witnesses have told us that following the presentation, don't address the group, and she said something to the effect of how can we use GSA to help our candidates in the next election? Do you recall this? It's a pretty leading statement. Yes. Um, not saying, do you recall, it, 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 it was a leading statement and I think you get a leading answer uh, when you ask those. Uh, yes. The Hatch Act investigators did not give you your own deposition transcript, is that correct? No, they did not. Was your lawyer permitted to attend the deposition for the other witnesses? No, he was not. So you were not represented at those? No. You weren't given the deposition transcripts for any of the witnesses, were you? No. So you're not. answering things kind of blindly in this case. Yes, I you? am. Uh, were you ever told who the witnesses were? No, I was not. Well, how can you retaliate if you don't know who the witnesses were? <laughs> One can only imagine. I, I, I think that would be pretty difficult. Uh, how did this affect your ability to respond to these uh, ac accusations? As, I st as we stated in our letter in responding to the Office of Special Counsel report, it's I almost impossible to respond when you don't know what exactly was said, when, Thank where, how. Thank you. I'll yield Mr. Burton. How much time do I have, Mr. Chairman? Minute 30. Uh, okay. Mr. Uh, Davis, I think I'd rather pass and wait for my five minutes because it's going to take longer than a minute and a half. Okay. You could yield um, to Mr. Micah. I'm going to yield to Mr. Micah. Okay, Mr. Micah. Well, uh, Ms. Stone, welcome back. I, I warned you in the beginning when we first talked. See, they were out to get you, uh, you know, Mr. Waxman went through the little scenario with a $20,000 contract. Couldn't find anything there. 
So they went on their fishing expedition. He brought up the Sun uh, uh, contract, uh, which was before you were there, and you, uh, there was nothing there. So they managed to find something in this meeting. Let me ask you once, one more time. Did you initiate the uh, political briefing? I did not. Okay. Did you see the uh, briefing before it was uh, presented by no. Jennings? No. Okay. Um, you know, you know, you're sort of a. You know, first of all, you're a Republican minority, a woman, uh, a, G a GOP contributor. So. Uh, and they've targeted you, and they're circling around uh, you to come after you. Uh, I was stunned that I did not know that the, uh, the general counsel who we turned this over to, Office of Special Counsel, at the end of this article that I inserted into uh, the record, did you know that the, the Doan investigation, one of the most high profile undertaken by the Office of Special Counsel, Scott Block, who is himself under investigation, by the Office of Personnel Management for allegedly retaliating against employees who disagree with uh, his policy. No. <laughs> okay. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Doan, I am straining, oh. trying to, to figure out <clears throat> where the truth ends and something else begins. And uh, you have accused uh, this side of the owl of uh, this gotcha mentality and what have you. But I want to go back to some of your statements, Ms. Doan, and, and maybe you can help me. When you testified before our committee on March 28th, you stated, and I quote, I do not think that any government agency should be engaging in partisan political activity. I know you're reading something, but this is very important. Do you remember saying that? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Uh, well, you're taking up my time. I do not, you said, I do not think that any government agency should be engaging in partisan political activity. That was back before our sworn testimony, March 28th. Do you remember that? Um, yes. Okay. You, al that. you also said, and I quote, I have to tell you, polls and stuff like that, this isn't my thing. This isn't what really motivates me or energizes me. Do you recall that? Yes, I do say that. You, you said the same thing to the Office of the Special Counsel. You said, and I quote, I don't care about polls and election results, end of quote. Do you remember that? Yes. Even today, your written testimony, Ms. Doan, states, quote, none of my actions, however, has been intended for or resulted in personal or partisan political gain. I want, I want to ask you about the veracity of these statements, your intentions and your motivation. First, it's a matter of public record that both you and your husband are or have been Republican National Committee regents. To be a regent, you have to raise $250,000 for the Republican Party. And as regents, you have been invited to fundraising events with the White House officials. Is that correct? Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Well, um, correct me. Um, but you don't have to raise the funding. You can do your own contributions if you chose. You did yours? Yes. OK, thank you. We have been informed that on May 17, 2005, you attended a regent's breakfast at St. Regis Hotel. The speaker was Al Hubbard who works at the White House as assistant to the President for e Economic Policy. Do you recall attending that, uh, the meeting on May 17, 2005? Yeah, basically. Let me show you a document that references this meeting. This is an email you wrote to your husband, Douglas Doan, on his official government computer at the Department of Homeland Security where he worked. You wrote it on the same day you met with Mr. Hubbard at 1.14 p.m. This is your draft email to Mr. Hubbard. And here's what it says in part. Thanks for the excellent comments as the region's breakfast today. I want to thank you again for helping move my bio forward for consideration as the SBA administrator. So, <clears throat> so and then end of quote. And then, so this is, this was before you were appointed as GSA administrator. You were trying to become the head of the SBA. Your email then goes on to say something that is extremely interesting. It says, as I mentioned, I believe that the party has a unique opportunity to make about a 5 percent swing of the black votes to the GOP. You go on to say one of the largest concentrations of wealth and influence lies in the black business community, small black business owners who represent the largest percentage of participants in the various SBA programs. Are you familiar? Yes. Very well. Very well. 
And in the third paragraph, you say this, as the SBA Administrator, I would have an unparalleled ability to serve as an articulate and passionate ambassador for the President's agenda and at the same time to be in a position to encourage both funding and votes to the GOP. Do you recall that? No, but I'm reading it here. You don't recall that? Your own email? All right. Ms. Doan, this says that you would encourage both funding and votes to the GOP, doesn't it? I mean, the document you're looking at. My intention here was to simply be a good example. I was a private citizen at the time. I was not in a political position, and I had not had a hatch act briefing. But you had also said that you, you said earlier that you weren't in, interested in the political stuff. You weren't interested in any kind of partisan uh, stuff. One of the things, the problem here, Ms. Doan, is that when we take all the, the things combined, and I've heard you, I've listened to you, you've great, given great statements, but when we combine everything, it leans more towards um, not pure truthfulness under oath than truthfulness. And, and that's what I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm trying to, to, to get where, where do you stand in all of this? I'm, I'm, because it seems as if you, when there, when, there, when there are questions about your truthfulness, then you go off and you say things like, well, you made a mistake. Well, where do the mistakes end and the truth begin? First, Congressman, one email in a lifetime does not constitute a passion. Secondly, this is something that occurred as a private citizen long before I became a political appointee and long before I actually understood the rules and regulations that surround political appointees, Hatch Act briefings, Hatch Act training, and things of that nature. But you also said, Ms. Doan, in the email about a very specific goal, 5 percent swing of black votes to the GOP. Congressman Cummings, I cannot tell you exactly what the context was in which this uh, email was written at the time. What I can tell you is that then I was a private citizen. Now I am uh, in a political position. You can I was not the GSA administrator at the time. I had not had a Hatch Act briefing. Um, Thank you. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. It is up. Uh, I Mr. yield myself two minutes before you recognize uh, yes. Mr. Uh, Burton. Uh, so I couldn't. I could not, for the record, remember an email I sent May 17, 2005. And I don't think that makes me dumb or a liar or anything else. We send out hundreds or thousands of emails. And to go back two years for an email that was not shown you before today, was it? No, I just saw it. How, how are you supposed to remember what you said on that uh, date? So take your time on these things. The don't let them push you around. Okay. Secondly, there's nothing wrong with being an African American Republic. Uh, they, they seem to put something on it. You are not interested in the nitty gritty that was given in this presentation, I gather, from the White House. And when you say no. it is not your passion, the nitty gritty of who won by what percent. But as an African American woman entrepreneur who has been successful, understand that being a role model uh, can set a great example for making uh, inroads for our message uh, to the African American community. Is that correct? That is absolutely true. This is a great party. It is very supportive of blacks and black entrepreneurs. And put, setting somebody up who has been successful is a, is a great uh, by leading by example. I don't think that, I mean, from my perspective, that's not I inconsistent in any way with not having your passion being the nitty gritty of winning election campaigns and percentages and what do you do that. There are a lot of Americans who aren't into the nitty gritty of politics. They write checks. They have certain philosophical beliefs. They want to serve their country on both sides. Good people. That doesn't mean they're into the nitty gritty of politics. And frankly, I've Got to, if I were you, and this was my introduction to the nitty-gritty of politics coming before this committee, I, I don't think I'd want to know more about it or be involved with it. So uh, from my perspective, I don't see any inconsistency here, but I see a desire on the other side that you're an African-American Republican, so you've got a big bullseye on you, uh, and I understand that. And I would, uh, that, that's the end of my two minutes, and I think we're ready to recognize Mr. Plant. Gentlemen, it's time has uh, yielded back. Mr. Plant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I regret I need to leave for another meeting, but I would like to yield my time to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. I thank the gentleman for yielding. You know, this is, this is a very amusing to me. Uh, under the guise of being fair and, and thorough, the chairman is saying he wants to conduct investigations to get to the bottom of the quote, unquote, illegal activities that may have taken place. But uh, 
you can't get him to bring Stephen Hadley before this committee. Stephen Hadley was destroying and sneaking classified information out of the, or, no, uh, Sandy Berger, excuse me, Sandy Berger was. Uh, we cannot get Stephen Hadley, you're right. Correct that, correct that. Okay, Sandy Berger was uh, stuffing classified documents into his uh, socks and destroying them, but we can't get you to bring him before the committee. And uh, I'd really like to know why. In addition to that, Valerie Plain, the uh, ranking Republican on this committee, asked that uh, you bring Valerie Plain before the committee. And I don't think we ought to hold our breath on that. We'll probably die of suffocation. Uh, but when you were in the minority and Al Gore went to a Buddhist temple and got $65,000 in campaign contributions, you defended him. When Bill Clinton took money in the White House, according to Johnny Chung, Johnny Chung said it was like a turnstile over there. You put the money in and you get in and get what you want. You guys wouldn't do anything to investigate that. You tried to block it. When money came in from Communist China, from the head of the Communist China Intelligence Agency that was given in, in uh, Hong Kong to Johnny Chung, you guys didn't want to investigate that. When James Riotti was getting money from the Lippo Group, millions of dollars for the Clinton campaign, and John Wong testified to that effect, you didn't want to do anything about that. We sent five criminal referrals to Janet Reno, five. And those criminal referrals were very, very clear to the point, and we had documented evidence that should have resulted in indictments to people in the Clinton administration. Five, Janet Reno, the attorney general for President Clinton, blocked every one of them, never even looked into them. She was the greatest blocker, uh, greater than anybody I ever saw in the NFL. And the minority didn't want to do anything about it. They just kept saying we were on a witch hunt, witch hunt, witch hunt. Well, I don't know, what, what do you call this? What do you call this? And why won't you bring in people that we know broke the law, like Sandy Berger and Valerie Plain, and bring her in and let her testify as to what she said? You just don't want to do that. I, 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 I can't understand when you defended the corruption in the Clinton administration so vigorously, even though there was over 100 people that fled the country or took the Fifth Amendment because they were trying to protect that administration, even though we had people from the White House come down here time and time and time again and say they couldn't remember anything. They had an epidemic of memory loss down there, at least. Ms. Dolan, Dolan has, is here testifying. She's not saying she forgot everything, like uh, we had the chief counsel down at the White House and all the subordinates down there saying, oh, I can't remember who hired this, and who hired them, and who did what, and who did what when. And so what I can't understand, uh, Mr. Chairman, is why there appears to be such hypocrisy on your side of the aisle. If you wouldn't do a thorough investigation when the Clinton administration was very clearly violating the law time after time after time, and we had witnesses at that table time after time after time, why is it you're pursuing this? Why, why are you creating this kind of an investigation? This, this, is really, this is really a witch hunt. What we did had documented evidence. We had people under oath very clearly stating that they personally were involved in campaign contributions that were illegal, that involved the president and his staff and others in the administration. And you blocked them, blocked them, blocked them, blocked them, and stopped every, every chance you got. You blocked, the attorney general blocked them. That whole administration blocked everything. And there's no question that the corruption was, was throughout the entire uh, White House. So all I can say, Mr. Chairman, is I think this ought to be made a part of the record, all this information, because uh, uh, this in my opinion, what's going on today is, is really a witch hunt. And, and to pursue this the way you're doing it, when you won't bring uh, uh, Sandy Berger or Valerie Plain before this committee, and yet you'll, in, you'll subpoena the Secretary of State, who's got a little bit to do around this world, it just doesn't make sense to me. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I won't comment on your statement, just the record, historical record will speak for itself. I, I know you won't. 
Uh, it's now uh, Mr. Clay's turn. Oh, you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Dome, for being here. Ms. Dome, prior to your um, May 31st, 2006 start as administrator of GSA, you were in private sector, correct? I was retired, actually. You were retired, and then um, prior to that, how long did you support and, and, and work for um, President Bush's election and, and re-election? Re how far does that go back? I've been a Republican for decades. So since 2000, you worked on behalf of President Bush's election? Um, actually, initially, it, it was Elizabeth Dole. As a woman, you have to support another woman running for office. Sure, sure. And, and is it possible that um, uh, once you got to GSA, you perhaps did not uh, come out of the campaign mode but still I uh, thought you were campaigning as far as, as, as helping re Republican congressional candidates, helping uh, the Republican Absolutely Party look good? Absolutely not Congressman Clay. I mean, is, no it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it at all possible no, that you perhaps? this is a leading perhaps? question, and the answer to that is no. Okay, the I, that's no, all I wanted no was the, the question. Now, let me ask you, in your opening statement, you say uh, uh, that you have... Uh, that, that you have pursued helping uh, in increasing opportunities for, for small minority women and disadvantaged business in enterprise. Can you give me some examples of how you have helped uh, minority-owned businesses and disadvantaged business with GSA? The largest contract that GSA has awarded internally for IT infrastructure support has gone to a service-disabled veteran company um, that is also an 8A company. Um, it's a historic contract. We're really proud of it. It was initially targeted for a full and open competition, and GSA has done an incredible job of making these opportunities available. The largest government-wide acquisition contract vehicle, VETS, which we just awarded, is uh, a multi-billion dollar contract vehicle, the first time ever, and we've managed to garner the support of the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense to utilize these vehicles on behalf of these service-disabled veterans. These are, are, are achievements of which I am enormously proud. The 30-day schedule challenge, which is making the opportunities for the schedules available to more small and minority businesses, collapsing the time it takes them to get an award so they can offer those good and services to the federal government Thank sooner you. is Thank the you, biggest Stone, help we can give. Response. You, uh, let me go on to another question then. Uh, in, in your written testimony for today's hearing, you argue that you never intended to suggest that any GSA employee was lying to the Office of Special Counsel. Uh, here's what you said, and I quote, I have never accused nor intended to accuse anyone of maliciously trying to mislead or lie to the Office of Special Counsel or Congress, characterizations of that sort are simply not true. But when you look at what you actually said about your GSA colleagues, the only reasonable conclusion anyone could draw from your statements is that you were implying that these GSA officials were not telling to the truth. Now let's just go right to the transcript. When uh, OSC investigators asked whether you thought uh, these could you GSA please point officials, me to the Bates number, excuse please? me, ma'am, let me oh, finish okay. the question, hold okay. it, would make up these stories about you, you responded, I think one or two of them do not wish me well. In that statement, aren't you saying that GSA officials are lying to Congress and the Office of Special Counsel, that no, they I am fabricated not. their accounts? No, I am not. But what said I said it. is that I think it is possible, the operative word there being possible, that if, if is another important word, a leading question were asked, these are all supposed, these are all you know, subjective supposed. Yes, this Ms. is a direct Dunn, you quote said from the transcript. They don't wish you well, so therefore they are not telling the truth, right? No, that is not. No, that is that's not what you said. The, no, I did not say that. If you go to Bates' number, I'm sorry. If Which you go to Bates number 385, please. I got it go. right the here. The quote, there is nothing in there. It says, I think it is possible that if a leading were question were asked, yes, I think one or two of them do not wish me well, period, yeah. end of statement. Okay, later There is in nothing your about this truth. There is nothing ma about. I, I have a limited amount of time. Let me go on, okay? But later I, in your you interview. I want to get to the truth, I thought. 
Later in your interview, you explain why you don't believe the testimony of the other GSA official. According to the transcript, you stated that the witnesses were not credible because they have an ax to grind. That's on page 391. They have an ax to grind, so therefore they are not telling the truth. That's what you meant, isn't it? No, that is not what I meant. Well, what We're did still you mean? in the period of subjection. I mean, sub conjecture. Subjection. No, what no, did no, you mean then? Conjecture. If you look at the context in which it was asked, after the first, I guess, five hours of the second day, so that puts us somewhere around eight hours into the interview process, they said, now, is there anything else that we can think of, that you can think of, that could possibly, you know, cause this confusion, this and the other? And then we talked about the fact that the information was in the press. We talked about the fact that they had been asked leading questions, the fact that they had been interviewed in advance. And, in fact, we tried to find out had they been interviewed by the committee before being interviewed by the Office of Special Counsel, which sadly it appears it is possible they had been. All of these, we were talking about it in the context of could this have influenced the outcome. This was one of several different and fairly lengthy discussions during an hour of what could possibly, what could you suppose could have made this happen. That's the context in which it happened. Gentlemen, which, time which has expired. Do you want an additional minute? Yes, sir. I'll yield you another minute. Which you, which you also stated that uh, dur during the investigation that they had poor to totally inferior performance. Uh, they are totally inferior, so therefore they are not telling the truth. Is that, is that no, right? No, this was something totally different. Um, this was actually within, this was a discussion I believe that happened earlier. And as I mentioned, within the first 20 or so minutes of the uh, interrogation process or interview process, whatever you're calling it, um, the folks actually started bringing up the concept of performance reviews. And they wanted to know um, in detail about what happens during performances, how are they done, what happens to people if they get a per poor performance review. It starts from the very beginning of the interview process. There were several places, Congressman Clay, where I said, where are we going with this? What is this all about? Because it wasn't clear to me, and they said, we asked the questions. That's right, and, and that's all a part of okay. the interrogation process, Ms. Doan. And one of the problems I have uh, is that it is very hard to believe your testimony because you are always changing your story. You tell the special counsel on the oath that you think the employees are making up stories, and then you tell us you never said that. I never said that. I don't that. know how. how I did not say they were making up stories. I said today. that if they were at, if they were given leading statements, they might um, misunderstand what they heard. I never said you're trying to put words in my mouth, Congressman, uh, and I know I'm you don't intend that. that. I'm, I'm quoting. But I need you. To, you're I'm not quoting, quoting from, from the transcript. No, you're not. You are Regular not order. quoting yes, verbatim. Gentlemen's, gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, I'm going to yield one minute to Mr. Cummings out of our, our bank. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I just, uh, as I listened to the comments of Mr. Burton, I just wanted, and having served on this committee for 11 years, I just want to read from the 1998 uh, version of the investigation of political fundraising improprieties. Uh, and it says, according to, uh, at page 3927, According to Norman Ornstein, a congressional expert at the Conservative American Enterprise Institute, the Burton investigation is going to be remembered as a case study in how not to do a congressional investigation and as a prime example of investigation as farce. According to the New York Times, the committee's efforts are a House investigation travesty and a parody of a, re a reputable uh, investigation. Uh, the Washington Post called the investigation its own cart in his own cartoon a joke and deserved embarrassment, end of quote. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Sally. Mr. Chairman, yep. Uh, Leave me alone. Could you ask, uh, yeah, Mr. Sally's name. Uh, Mr. Sally is recognized for five can minutes. I, uh, can I? I'll, I'll take it. Uh, okay, Thank but you're going to yield your time, Mr. Sally? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield uh, my time to Mr. Issa. Thank you. Uh, before we do that, I'd like to take a minute out of my bank and give Mr. Burton an opportunity to respond. I hate to go back and rehearse the past, but I want to make every, sure everybody gets their point across. Now, I think it's very important that uh, uh, we, we don't pay attention to what newspaper accounts like the Washington Post said about our investigation. We had 100 people flee the country or take the Fifth Amendment. That is fact. We had people testify that they were getting money through the White House, that they were getting money from the Lippo Group in Indonesia, 
that they were getting money from the communist Chinese CIA that was given to the campaign, con a campaign of the Bill Clinton uh, uh, administration. Now, that is fact. You can say anything you want to and read what the Washington Post said, but the facts are the facts. Uh, Mr. Sally is recognized. Uh, he oh, yielded uh, to me, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, just a minute. Let me start the clock so that we'll get to full time. Thank you, Mr. Sally, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, the, the way we do business here, you're probably figuring out one side badgers you, one side leads, one side uh, quotes out of context, and then uh, usually the other side, uh, that would be us right now, we're supposed to rehabilitate the false statements, the innuendo, the, all the things that were done earlier. I'm not going to do that uh, because I think you've done a very good job of explaining that you are consistent, that you have, in fact, told the truth and the whole truth, and that if you've made any mistake, it's been, in fact, allowing those leading questions and what-ifs from people who were trying to make a case on you, from a prosecutor who is not independent in the sense of unbiased, but, in fact, who gets paid to try to find makeable cases, uh, who asked you unreasonable questions and clearly, clearly lied about the fact that this would be kept private either lied through his action or lied through his subordinate's action when uh, information that was given under oath, confidentially, under that assurance, consistent with the federal laws, was leaked. And, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry for your agency and for those men and women who may have gotten threes or fours or twos, not necessarily perfect scores, but in fact deserved not to have their private lives and their performance made public. I, I, I do want to talk about one thing, though, and, and perhaps because you and I uh, are, in fact, both uh, unabashed, loyal Republicans who have given to a number of uh, campaigns over the years, including several present and former presidents. I, I just want to put something in context. You know, they, they seem to they talk about you and your husband over a period of, of five or six years, three or four campaigns, uh, giving, you know, Twenty or so thousand dollars per year per each of you, as a huge amount of money, and and it is. I think people people look and say that's a lot of money to give, even if it's a thousand dollars each to twenty candidates. But I I, I want to put something in context uh, because I don't think you will, and 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 I think it's fair that we should put in context. Is it true that you have given to, to the best of your recollection, Women's Corporate Directors Education Fund? the American Women's Business Centers, which is a film project, the Washington, D.C. Rape Crisis Center, the D.C. House of Ruth uh, Homeless Shelter, for, primarily for women, I presume, the Whitman Walker AIDS Research Program, the New York Stage and Film Foundation, CARE. Uh, so far, are those all correct? Yes. Uh, how about... Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, Mr. Davis is mentioning uh, Mary Landrew. I understand you also gave, but we won't consider that a charity at this point, will we? <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, Not yet. We went okay, to high school uh, together. You've given to Girls Incorporated, to the United Negro College Fund, to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, yes. to the National Foundation for Teaching and, uh, of Entrepreneurship, yes. something you know a great deal about, uh, to the Committee of... Uh, 2000 Education Foundation. Committee of 200. 200, I'm sorry. It's growing. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Shakespeare Theater of D.C. Yes. Yes. You know, we have a fine center in San Diego. We should talk later. Uh, the, university, <laughs> the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Yes. Uh, which you attended. Yes. Uh, to Vassar, which yes. you also attended. And my understanding, because it's been made public, is that there, these contributions each are as much as $1 million. Not every single one, and besides, I don't want to get a lot of mail. And no, these are no. mine. This is not okay. my house. <laughs> no, and, and I'm not trying to out you as, as a, uh, a generous philanthropist that you are. I just, I just want to put it in context that when you, when you give out five or tenfold as much to charity every year to try to make America a better place, would it be unreasonable to give a fraction as much to people that you believe, including Mary Landrew, apparently, uh, 
we'll make America a better place. Isn't that sort of a consistent balance of your giving back that you've done all your life? Yes. Well, it's, uh, I hope I haven't badgered you too much by, uh, by bringing these out, but it, it does seem to me like if we're going to bring balance to this hearing, we need to bring balance that one statement was made that you've said you regret, uh, a statement which it is up to others to decide whether or not that was outside the bounds, and if it was, how venal it was, and it appears to be probably not outside the bounds, but even if it bounds, but even if it was, uh, it's a pretty de minimis statement uh, compared to many of the things we've heard here today. And as this hearing goes on, I hope you're given a full and complete uh, ability to do so. And I'm sorry that I did not give you a chance to answer more. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Tierney. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stone, I, I just want to cut a little ground. I, I heard you testify earlier that. Um, that you didn't want to speculate and that you thought the special counsel was asking you for speculation. Uh, and I continue to be concerned about uh, comments that you made about the performance of uh, the individuals that work with you. And so I went to the transcript and you talk about, you say you don't want to begin to speculate how this could have come up. All right, so you're clearly discounting speculation, but then you go on and you say, but I do find it. So it's no longer speculating here. You're finding it highly disturbing that some of the most vocal proponents while the most articulate speaking out against me are also the people who are people I've either moved on or they are, I don't want to say permanently demoted, but they're kind of, then you probably say, until extensive rehabilitation of their performance occurs, they will not be getting promoted and they will not be getting bonuses or special awards or anything of that nature. Now before you tried to say, well, it's impossible for me to retaliate because their reviews had happened months before. You're not talking about months before here when you're talking to the special counsel. We're talking about things that you apparently intend that will occur in the future. You say until that rehabilitation, they will not be getting promoted, they will not be getting special awards. Do you want to respond to that? Yes, I'd love to. Uh, the fact of the matter is, as Congressman, is that you have to look at this once again in the context in which it occurred. First, no, no. Oh, wait, it wait, was, stop. No, it was speculation. Stop. There. stop. No, Stop. I will not. We're do not going to let you run the table on this, Ms. Stone. I'm going to ask you a question, and if I have to ask the chairman Tierney. to instruct you okay. to be responsive, I will. All right. Now, what I'm telling you is I am reading the context of your thing where you clearly say, I don't want to begin to speculate. So enough of the speculation. Then your next statement directly is, but I do find it highly disturbing that some of the most vocal proponents are the most articulate speaking out against me are also the people who are the people I've either moved on or they are. I don't want to say permanently demoted, but they're kind of. Until extensive rehabilitation of their performance occurs, they will not be getting promoted and they will not be getting bonuses or special awards or anything of that nature. That's the context. That's the exact language you used. Congressman, now, you do not have to raise your voice to me. Well, I, I came had to, here madam, because willingly. I had to raise it because you wouldn't stop when I asked you to stop. So now the question to you is do you intend to hold back these people's bonuses or promotions? Yeah. This is an in. Uh, inappropriate comment to have because we have to talk about the context in which it happened no, and the tense. No, we're not going to go there again. I'm asking you. Mr. Chairman. There is only intent. one place to go Mr. there. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, would you please instruct I will not the witness have to be responsive? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would be happy to use my minute, since Mr. Tierney doesn't, to you give her an extra option, minute sir. to put her. I have, a, I have a minute I can use you don't uh, have to allow her to answer Mr. the question. Uh, Mr. Davis. She ought to be allowed to answer the question. Uh, Mr. Davis. Her, uh, I, uh, she ought to be allowed to answer the question, but it is Mr. Uh, Tierney's time, and no one can take a time uh, and interfere with that. So uh, let me try to put some order to this. I'd appreciate it. We that. have five minutes for each member to ask questions. Uh, w when the five minutes is up, if you're still answering the question, we let you complete. But if a member asks you a question, it is not an opportunity to start on a monologue. You have to answer the question because otherwise it uses up the five minutes. Let's be fair to each other. But when, what if they're really wrong? Whether you have an opportunity to answer the question and uh, correct the record, but not to go on and on and on about it, and especially if five minutes can be used up like that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tierney, I'm going to uh, allow you to continue, and I'm going to um, Thank you, make Chairman. up this time that is elapsed. The importance of this is that you stated specifically what will happen in the future. So I think it's very relevant here to find out whether or not you have any intention of not promoting these people or not getting their bonuses or special awards or anything of that nature, as you used in your language. The, keeping in mind, the Office of Special Counsel found that there was nothing on their records that comported 
with your, well, your statement that they needed extensive rehabilitation or had poor performance? The Office of Special Counsel's record report is flawed. It omits critical evidence and it is riddled with errors. And I simply believe that it cannot be trusted. I've already commented on that in my comments in response to the report. I will tell you that as I tried to explain earlier, the performance review process at GSA has multiple levels and phases. Everybody at these meetings are not my direct report, so I have no input into whether or not they're getting a performance review of this or that or that rating, a bonus or not a bonus. That is their manager's well, determination. Why would you make a statement that they will not be getting promoted and they will not be getting bonuses or special awards? You seem to be pretty clear under oath there. No, that you we have are an still in the area of supposition and conjecture in my mind. The word will is supposition and conjecture. Um, they actually, will not be getting you promoted. may notice. They will not be getting I noticed as I went through the transcript that I have probably some problems sometimes with tense uh, and as well as with uh, personal pronouns. So you'll, you'll uh, see that there are some issues. Let me suggest you what the Office of Special Counsel thinks your problems are. In summary, none of the performance reviews indicates that any of the witnesses who provided testimony adverse to Ms. Doan were poor to totally inferior performers, as she alleged. Thus, Administrator Doan's implication that the adverse witnesses were biased against her simply is not credible. Finally, it's troubling that the Administrator Doan made the above unsubstantiated allegations during an official investigation of her actions. It arguably indicates a willingness on her part not only to use her position in a way that is threatening to anyone who would come forward, but also suggests a willingness to retaliate against anyone who would be so disloyal as to tell the truth about a matter that she confesses she does not remember. So he thinks that your recollection is, is particularly bad on that. And there's replete, comments replete throughout the record on that situation. Well, this is a good example of a flaw because he chose not or they chose not to uh, actually um, mention another portion of my testimony where I talked about how the performances were occurring and actually commended some of the employees for certain portions of their performance, but they, they neglected that balancing act when they reported these comments. And these are things that I pointed out in my response to the report. But you did use the words, they will not be getting in promotions. And that you want us to believe is some sort of speculative or tense issues. You have to look at what came before. And yes, we're talking about what goes on in a process and how does a performance review process happen. But I will tell you, no, I don't retaliate and will not retaliate against employees because their advancement, their bonuses are based on performance. Okay. And you use the word that you will retaliate against them just for the fun of it under oath? This is unfair, Congressman. I, you have not no unfair. facts to substantiate this. I'm I do not and statement. will not retaliate against employees. I have been the strongest advocate for my GSA employees, and I will continue to be so. Was you being a strong advocate when you said that they were not going to, that you had their rehabilitation was needed, their performance was needed to be improved, they will not be getting promoted? They will not be getting bonuses? Congressman, I am all about improvement, and the answer there is no. Gentlemen's oh, time yeah, has let expired. Let me take one minute, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Davis. For one Ms. Doan, did you say you were going to retaliate against? He, he just alleged you said you were going to retaliate against. No, they putting that. words That's in my mouth. That's not in the transcript. I've, I've read the whole thing. There's, th this is conjecture and interpretation. Yes. And what, as I understand the situation, uh, this was a nine or ten hour uh, interview where they asked you to conjecture why employees may have said certain things. You referred back to some of them having employee reviews that may not have been, quote, poor, but they didn't allow them to get bonuses. Is that correct? That's true. With a three and you conjectured bonus. maybe this was something. You didn't bring this up, did you? I did not. This was brought up by the questioners in what, the ninth hour? Well, it started in the first hour, but okay. again in the ninth hour, throughout the entire nine hours. And you didn't even know who all these employees were, did you? No, I, I did they not. They didn't share their testimony with you, did they? No, they did not. So you were conje this was all conjecture. You didn't know. You don't even, in many of these cases, have the authority to rate these employees, do you? No, they do not report to me. So if you wanted to retaliate, did you have the authority to retaliate against? Uh, uh, no, uh, I do not. Against any of them, maybe maybe one or two? or. And this goes back to the first point. There's only one or two that were in my mind throughout this entire process, because only one or two people report to me. So this is just basically a wild goose chase. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Micah is next. Thank you. Let me uh, pursue that a bit. Uh, um, Chairman Waxman, in his opening comments, said this is a, an example of supervisors imposing their politics on employees. Those are, uh, I took down his 
not very good at shorthand, but I took down his word. So you were imposing your politics on employees. Uh, is it not a fact that these were schedules? Was this a Schedule C? Brown bag uh, lunch, yes. All what, presidential appointees? All presidential appointees. And you were imposing your politics on these presidential employed, employees. That's what you're guilty of, right? So Chairman says, yes. Um, so um, I, I, again, I, I, was st I, I, I just fell off my chair, just about spit up my coffee. I, and I saved the Washington Post when I read after we thought we were going to get uh, this handed to an impartial uh, uh, review, your alleged uh, Hatch Act violations, to find out, uh, in fact, that uh, the draft uh, was leaked to the Washington Post and the media before you got that. Is that correct? That is true. And in fact, the, the, it was such a stumbling, bumbling thing, and I, I still pr wish to pursue, Mr. Chairman, I, I either an emotion or just a request from you that, that the Government Reform and Oversight Committee investigate the leak of the draft of the Doan OSC report. How could we have a witness who uh, we were investigating and asked, and we, we really deferred to OSC to conduct the investigation and then get that information, that's where this was left, then have uh, leaked the draft uh, uh, to the, the press. Now, either the OSC, and I think they admitted to leaking it, but I want to find out who the individual is, or if anyone cooperated on the staff of this committee. That's not the way this investigative uh, committee should operate. Elaine Kaplan, who is uh, Scott Block's predecessor, this is the OSC, has commented widely in the press, I don't know if you knew this, uh, Ms. Doan, that the harsh report raises questions. Kaplan has suggested that Doan's comments may be a, a much more minor violation than Block is reporting. I, I asked you the question if you knew, and here's another report today about Block. I was, I'm trying to figure this out, and he's a, a, a appointee. Now, why, why is Block going after her in such a harsh uh, manner? Here's today's post. Meanwhile, the Inspector General, again, of the Office of Personnel Management at the behest of the President's Office of Management Budget is examining a complaint by OSC staff members and others who accuse Block of interfering with Hatch Act cases. Uh, absolutely astounding. I, <laughs> you had some misfortune, first of all. You know, you got into a little ta hassle over trying to do something about a bad diversity record at GSA and you tried to move uh, forward on a contract, which never incidentally uh, was executed, is that right? That's okay. true. That, uh, and then they couldn't find anything there, so they found this 26th uh, meeting. Again, did you initiate that meeting? I did not. Okay. Did you see, uh, again, did you I see did the report beforehand? No. Uh, were, who was invited to that? Political? Uh, the, the political appointees were invited by the White House. Have you ever been to one, or heard one of those before? No, this is in January. Okay, so I guess at a political event like this with political people like your well, appointee. it's a brown bag lunch. Were you all going to, uh, I, maybe you had a false impression, impression. Maybe Scott Jennings wanted to discuss spring planning uh, protocols uh, in Virginia. What you think that was his? I thought we were going to have a motivational speech. Okay. All right. Um, the OSC, the Office of Special Counsel, admits that the, at least four di different versions uh, of your al alleged comments have uh, been reported. Is that correct? Uh, yes, but they vary quite a bit. Okay. Uh, and so what they've tried to do today is, again, because you're a Republican, because you contributed to Republicans, because you're a minority uh, Republican, and uh, because you uh, are a, a, a woman. And the first time you came, uh, I must admit, uh, I thought they had you spooked a bit. But I want to tell you today, you creamed them. Uh, you, you've shot back. That's what you have to do. You said you were going to fight. You're, you, you weren't going to let them uh, get you down. But counter them. Don't be afraid to counter them. And when they try to cut you off, uh, you tell the context. Don't give them a yes or no answer. You tell them the context in which they're trying to take your words uh, out of uh, context. Did you ever threaten any of these employees? No. Or, or uh, let me say, did you ever threaten any of the uh, political appointees? No. At, before or since? No. Okay. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Watson. 
I want to thank the chairman for holding this hearing. It's very, very insightful. And I've sat here through the testimony on both sides, and I've heard the attacks on the chair, the attacks on our former president and former people in service. I've heard Mrs. Doan's responses. And one thing that is very troubling to me is that race has been interjected into the hearing. I originally thought this hearing was about the Hatch Act and whether it was violated or not. And I want to ask this question directly to you, Mrs. Stone. Do you feel that you are being attacked because you are a woman and an African American? I believe that this hearing has a completely different agenda that even I probably am not aware of and not experienced about. So I think this is a political thing between that's Can going Can you give on me here. a yes or a no? Because everybody keeps saying I'm under oath. Can you be more I don't think this is a race thing. I think this is a political thing that's going on here. Oh, good. So you don't think it's because you're a woman or because you're black? I try never to think in those terms. Wait I'm a minute. Sure yes or no? Can, can I get that? I don't know what the reality is here. What I know is that uh, I try minute. never to project those Can you those give me a yes or a no on that question? I'm I asking you a direct question. I can tell you that question. I do not interject race and assume those motives to other people. I do not do that because it's not helpful. Okay, good. So let's dismiss, and I want to say this to the people who have injected race and gender into this questioning, that you feel that it's for another agenda, but not about race and gender. No, what I said okay, is let's I clear. can't begin to understand what everyone's agenda is. I only know about myself. Okay, uh, fine. Uh, I am a female, and I am African American, and I resent the fact that race and gender is always thrown into it because I do not feel that this committee or the chairman of this committee would ever bring you in front of us because you are a woman and because you're a black. That's, I hope we have an understanding on that and I hope it will not be entered into this debate. My concern is about the Hatch Act and I'm gonna ask you a direct question. I'd like to get a direct answer. Did you violate the Hatch Act on that hearing under question when someone came in from the administration and talked about how we can get more Republicans elected? Do you feel that your actions, your presence violated the Hatch Act? I do not believe that I violated the Hatch Act and that is what I believe I responded to the Office of Special Counsel in my letter that went back in response to their report. Uh, I don't recall, and I've tried to tell everyone what I did recall from that day. Uh, what is curious is that we have probably over 30 folks who attended that meeting. Apparently, y'all and people have talked to part of them, but for whatever reason, they chose not to talk to all of them. Um, I don't know why we credit the few who appear to remember something, but we don't credit the ones who say they remember nothing. There's a lot of stuff going on here that I don't understand what went into the flawed report, but it is what it is, and as I've said, I'll live with it. I did my response, and I've, I've made my comments to the Yeah, to I'm the trying council. to get some direct answers, and it's really difficult. In oh, I'm this, sorry, I here. said I do not believe uh, I violated the Hatch Act, all right. and then I tried to explain okay. to you what I did, did to explain that. Did you that. make any statements that would encourage your subordinates to go out and recruit more Republican candidates? As I said in my testimony, I find it hard to believe I did. I do not recollect making the statement the Office of Special Counsel says that they said they heard other people say that I made. But um, it's my belief that that I that I do not recollect that. But I do try. I tried as hard as I could to tell them everything else I remembered about the meeting. And as I said before, I respect the right of the Office of Special Counsel to make their decision. They forwarded uh, okay, on to the president. Okay, reclaiming my time. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. 
Yeah, I find that you equivocate, and I've been listening, we've had two sets of hearings, mm -hmm. and I don't see you as a person who has foggy memory. Some things you can quote verbatim, you're looking at the testimony, and I don't buy the fact that you do not remember, and it is my assessment that you have violated the Hatch Act. Right. This you. is unfortunate. I am my time remembering. Is out. I. She, I don't think she needs to respond. It's an opinion. Everyone okay, uh, Mr. Bilbrey. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I take uh, one yes, of my minutes Bill. at this point? Let me just ask, the race and gender issue didn't come from Mrs. Doan. It was interjected on the other side today by introducing a two-year-old email that they had discovered uh, from you, Mrs. Doan, that you sent to the administration where you talked about some of your qualifications for helping to raise the Republican message when you were looking to be head of the Small Business Administration. She has never brought this into the context. This was brought in by the other side. And now they are trying to make it look like you are hiding behind it. And I just, uh, this is the problem with these kind of hearings is it gets picky. It starts off going after one thing and it is a moving target and you have a lot of information you are supposed to be held accountable for. How in the world someone is supposed to know what an email they sent two years ago was uh, is beyond me. I know I, I certainly couldn't uh, do it. And just to finish up my time, OSC stated that it interviewed over 20 individuals in attendance at the Jennings presentation, but they quote um, testimony from zero attendees in their report. They stated it wanted to keep witnesses anonymous for their own protection. How can you retaliate against people if you don't even know who they are? They don't identify them uh, uh, by number, which they could have done. They omit any reference to their testimony uh, at all. Do you, do you have access to this? No, I do not. Thank you. Um, Mr. Davis, I want to point out that the first reference at this hearing to the fact that uh, Ms. Doan is African American and a woman, which may be pertinent to the hearing, was in your opening statement. But we didn't talk about her being prosecuted for that reason. We just talked about her life experience. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bilbray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Ms. Administrator, uh, you know, the Hatch Act is a very personal thing with me. I was one of five so-called vulnerable Republicans that was a target of three Federal employees under the Clinton administration that ended up being indicted for violating the Hatch Act in a dirty tricks operation against Republican um, members of Congress. So this is very, very personal and very serious in my opinion. Now, there may be people up here that um, feel that you might have said or didn't say something at some meeting. None of us up here were at that meeting. Uh, there are those that claim to be at that meeting that say you say it's something and you've said no, you haven't. I'll take that at face value. When I hear somebody talk about a statement or an email that you sent prior to being in public service, and especially those of us who are elected officials. And, Mr. Chairman, I just got to say, I hope to God that none of us have pe constituents that are going to take political statements or even brochures we set out before we are elected that we all know we say things and a perception of what we'll do once we get into public service changes dramatically once you realize the rules of the game, get the briefing, and you actually get into it. And so I say, in all fairness, I think it's really inappropriate, especially for elected officials, to say that somebody said these kind of statements before they started public service, and obviously that was what they've done ever since. And I think that is very unfair, and I hope to God not, none of us have people go back and look at our public statements before being elected and then bring it back to us now and claim that has been our, all of that has been our earmark since service. Mr. Chairman, at this time I'd like to um, uh, yield my time to the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Shays. Ms. Doan, um, I think you're a remarkable person. I think you're a beautiful person. Uh, I regret that you've been treated the way you've been treated. Uh, they talk about it being an interrogation. Uh, we had last week a Democratic member say, I have a lot of questioning, but I have to say that after being here for 11 years, I hate it when witnesses are attacked. It bothers me, particularly when they are trying to do the best they can in the words of Thurgood Marshall with what they have. Well, with what you have, you have a lot. You have created an extraordinary business, you have given to charities, and you have shown an interest in politics in, frankly, a very naive way because you just wanted to help. And um, 
I don't care what the press thinks about what I'm going to say or anybody else. I just want to say to you, you are a remarkable person and you have been attacked and attacked and attacked and you have held your head up high. I just wish you would sometimes wait to let people finish the question because you answer a question they haven't even asked you and then they twist it by then saying, well, you know, whatever. I, I want to know, who have you retaliated against? No one to my knowledge. I would like someone in this hearing to tell me who she's retaliated against. Give me names. Give me names of people she's retaliated against. Gentleman Yu? Yes. What uh, Ms. Stone said to the Office of Special Counsel. I would counsel. like the name. All I want is the name. Oh. You ask her for questions, just give me a name. Okay, we will, give, we will get the names of the people right. who I'm testified sure you'll give me names. about her to this committee. And those were the people she referred to as getting a poor performance standard when they didn't. That is totally and those a were the people, Totally and those mistaken. Were the I reclaim she said my time. They will never I get bonuses. I reclaim my time. The bottom line is there is no name. You haven't retaliated against anybody. And you're being accused of doing something in the future which you haven't done. Then they talk about the fact that there was a performance as if you retaliated against somebody and the facts are clear that happened before. I find this hearing astonishing. And I just want to say, is there any, you've retaliated against no one, you have made an assessment of your employees fairly. You believe that some employees may not like you and you are being criticized for that? Well, I think there are some employees in my own office that sometimes don't like me. And I know there are a lot of people who have worked for me that may not. You know what? I don't think that's a, a surprising thing to say. What is surprising is that you had to answer questions under interrogation for nine hours. And this is it? This is it? All that we've come up with is a meeting shouldn't have happened and maybe, she said, how can I help our candidates? That's it. There has got to be a point where this hearing is ending and if anything, owe her an apology for what you put her through. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from California, Ms. Watson, wanted a, a half a minute and will yield. Yes, I made a statement uh, that race and gender was injected, and then there was a response that it came from this side. I will get the recording of this hearing to show that I think it was the ranking member that first injected that and someone else on that side, but we will get the evidence and have it played because I want to be sure uh, Mrs. Stone is not being targeted because she's a female and because she's uh, African-American. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Everybody's going to be investigating everybody here. And we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll find out what's happening. Mr. Yarmouth, your turn for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Doan, you I'm sure don't know this, but before I came to Congress, I was a writer and an editor. And um, I know good writing when I uh, see it and when I hear it. And I want to commend you on your opening statement because I thought the Berlin reference was a nice touch as well as your use of the term gotcha. And uh, that gives me a segue into what I perceive as the, is a typical response throughout this whole thing, which wa is always to um, lay blame, question the motives of others, and I understand why you may want to question the motives of, of others, but others, but it, it extends to also your your attorney, and this is in relation to the issue of the leak of the uh, Office of Special Counsel, and. Your attorney um, essentially charged that this was a, ca a quote carefully planned campaign to cause maximum damage, and accused essentially the um, OSC of, of leaking the report. And in response, the um, special counsel St Scott Block has claimed that um, actually someone from GSA has leaked. Uh, the report, and in a letter to your attorney in May, just a few weeks ago, he stated, quote, someone from GSA obtained a copy of OSC's report to your client from your client and then faxed it to the press. So let's, I'm going to ask you a series of uh, questions about that just to get it on the record uh, since you're now under oath. When did you receive uh, your first copy of the OSC report? 2 p.m. on Monday afternoon and the first reference in the media was 7.45 a.m. that morning. Okay, and how did you receive a copy of the report? Um, it came by courier in a sealed envelope, and um, there were uh, 
folks uh, who have watched me undo the seal of the envelope and pull it out. Okay. And um, have you shared, did you share the report with anyone at that time? Uh, it was really bad. So the answer to that was no. What I did was I took it myself because I was a little concerned and I went to the photocopy machine. I made a copy for my chief of staff and he and I sat in my office. Um, it took us a, you know, a little while to read it and we sat there together and we read it through the afternoon. But meanwhile, we had already, I guess it was about seven hours before, Gus started getting the questions from the press uh, citing quotations from the report. So we kind of knew they already had it. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, you, in response to um, Mr. Oh, Chief, I'm sorry. Can I just, I'm, I'm sure. and, and I know, and Congresswoman Watson, I don't mean to, to make it look like I'm not being clear. The one thing that is so odd about this is there's like at least two reports, and that's why I think you had that reference to it looks like it's a concerted attack. The report I'm talking about that I got is a May 18th report. Then there was this draft report that was actually already out there from May 17th. We never saw that one ever, and even now to this day, I get it, I got it off the internet. Um, okay. Uh, in relation to uh, questioning that Mr. Tierney uh, st engaged in with you, uh, you talked about this statement that you made, um, until extensive rehabilitation of their performance occurs, they will not be getting promoted and will not be getting bonuses or special awards or anything of that nature. I have two questions. One is that um, you said sometimes you have a problem with tents. And uh, basically, there are only three tenses. That's, no, that, that's not true. Oh, okay. Past, um, present, and future. No, there's like so, present perfective, there's present progressive, yes, but past in the, progressive. In, in, the past time, in, the, in the time continuum, that's grammar, but in the time continuum, there only, it either happened, it's about, it is happening, or it will happen. Or it's so ongoing as we talk. I'm trying to get a handle okay. on exactly where the issue of tense might relate to whether or not you actually um, were speculating about what you might do, what you may have in fact done, or what you were in the process of doing. Well, I thought I was using like a hortatory subjunctive right there, um, in which. Okay. One other question about that. You said that you were not in a position uh, to either deny um, benefits or promotions or so forth, or to uh, provide awards to the people uh, the, in question here. Um, are you familiar with, um, this is the United States Code uh, 45, section, chapter 45, 4503, agency awards. It says, the head of an agency may pay a cash award to and incur necessary expense for the honorary recognition of an employee who, by his suggestion, invention, superior accomplishment, or other personal effort, contributes to the efficiency, economy, or other improvement of government, blah, blah, blah. It also says that a cash award under this section, this is 4505A, shall be equal to an amount determined appropriate by the head of the agency, but may not be more than 10 percent of the employee's annual rate, so forth and so on. Does that seem to contradict the fact that you could have or had the power to reward or to deny awards to the people in question? I will admit I was not familiar with that code that you just read to me, and we're going to make a note of it and look into it. Thank you. Um, I will tell you, though, that there is a very big difference in uh, the way our performances are done, and you have to segment the difference between a spot award, an individual award, a group award, and a bonus, which is based on performance. These are all different types of compensation available to employees, and um, each one of them has different levels of authority and who makes the decision about it. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, Ms. Doan, it seems like you said you didn't have the authority. Now you find out you have the authority. Well, he just told me, and I and appreciate you didn't that, know that knowledge. I see. Well, I think, if, with all due respect, Chairman, I try to allow my managers to make their own decisions because that usually works best since they know the people who report directly to them. I'm going to yield myself a minute. control of my own time. For the record, I never could figure that thing out, <laughs> Henry's master. I guess what's confusing me is, is you, you know about authority or you don't know about authority that you may or may not have. When it's convenient for you at their hearing, you indicated to the Republican-appointed head of the Office of Special Counsel 
that you, were, you will make sure these people don't get these bonuses. And then when you're asked by Mr. Tierney, do you have the authority to retaliate? You said, well, I don't have the authority. And now uh, Mr. Yarmouth reads to you the provision that gives you the authority. And you said, well, I didn't know I had that authority. No, I, said, I thought I said I didn't, I wasn't aware of the code that he read to me, but I was happy to have heard it. We're going to look it up in its entirety. I also think that when I was talking to the uh, investigators for the Office of the Special Counsel, we were still in the area of conjecture. No, no, about I know how you've already you told things. us that you didn't, that that, that future tense sentence didn't mean it because you didn't mm -hmm. know future tense. Oh, you, you know something no, no. about a hortatory something or other. Uh, God, I feel like Tony <laughs> Soprano. Uh, <laughs> The, 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 uh, the point is you either know or you don't know about the authority you have and it looked like, according to a strict reading of, the, of those words, that you in the future will make your, uh, use your authority to make sure they don't get the rewards, they don't get the bonuses, they don't get whatever benefits they might otherwise get. That's incorrect. Okay, those words don't mean what they said. No. Uh, it's Mr. Souders. Chairman, let me take uh, one minute if I could. Gentleman's uh, right. And I may, I'll give myself two minutes. That's all right. Uh, first of all, I, two, two minutes of, of my time. Um, first of all, I think it's very, very clear. They're beating a dead horse at this point. As the head of the agency, I guess you have ultimate authority to do all kinds of things. But as I understand it, you don't get into the r performance ratings and that the individuals in question, some of them at least, had threes which didn't qualify them for a bonus. True. You couldn't do that, and there is zero, zero evidence that you retaliated against anybody. You did uh, a, in a speculative question that they asked you under seal, which was never supposed to come out to the public. You said, well, they might have had uh, uh, performance uh, problems, and frankly, if they didn't get a three or whatever, they couldn't get a bonus anyway. But I, I, I'm beginning to just see this hearing as kind of a waste of time. I mean, what are we doing? We ought to be talking about why can't we close our borders? Why do we have constant gasoline shortages? How can children in foster care systems end up abused? Why does it cost so much to adopt? Why is it so hard for American businesses to hire qualified students from other countries? How well does foreign trade service serve small businesses? Why is it so hard to build a nuclear plant in America? Uh, what are the plans to repair our interstate highways? What did Speaker Pelosi tell Syria when she visited there? What are we doing to stop terrorists? What are we going to do to reduce gang violence? Why are we, what are we doing to stop human trafficking? How is the war on drugs going? Uh, how do we stop terrorists? What can be done uh, to improve security clearance backlogs and processing? Why haven't we examined first responder interoperability closer? How is National Guard readiness? What oversight? Uh, I mean, w those are the issues we ought to be focusing on, not who said what to do in an email from two years ago. But let me ask you, just to why, why I have you here, what issues at GSA alone could the committee look at? that would help you improve and help the American taxpayers to help improve the effectiveness of the agency? First and foremost is the important role that procurement officers play in our mission and what can we do to attract more into government service, how can we protect them, how can we stand up for them, and how can we make sure that there's effective balance in their actions and, and the work that they do that's so critical to our agency. This is the pivotal issue facing GSA right now. Uh, Mr. Souter. I thank the chairman and uh, I'm going to use my f five minutes w while you're here to actually raise a substantive GSA issue rather than the latest oh, rounds of uh, gotcha games. Uh, and it's actually somewhat ironic because as a Republican who got uh, only 54 percent last time, I found that the GSA was, has been incredibly unfair to the people of my district and so I certainly wasn't a beneficiary <coughs> of any bias. Uh, that um, that uh, I want to lay out the issue for the record and hope we can do follow up. Uh, we have a, a new Social Security office in the city of Fort Wayne that's been built at the edge of the city where there's no mass transit access. Point one is that this is now the second time GSA has done this to Fort Wayne, a city of 240,000 people. The last time was a disability office where they put it beyond bus transit access. That the second point is, is that they did contact the city of Fort Wayne for a suggested site. Uh, then after they got the recommended site, they redid the map that excluded the site by one block. Then GSA uh, sent to uh, a, a, um, the bid out and uh, the bidder that was selected happens to be not from our area and has won almost all the regional bids including for the other office. Apparently, and the only reason we know, because apparently these bids aren't made public, 
uh, is that this, the losing bidder came to us and complained about the process because he thought there was a requirement that you had to have mass transit, which apparently there isn't. Um, that uh, uh, the next point would be is, is that GSA then explained to us that the second bid cost would have cost the GSA $30,000 more a month or $360,000 more a year. But now, t because mass transit is required, it's just unclear whether it has to be accommodated in the building, the city of Fort Wayne may be paying up to $1.2 million a year to get mass transit there. Now, taxpayers are taxpayers. That the fact is, is this is a net loss to taxpayers of $850,000. Uh, and right now, we're having trouble figuring out how to do it. Now, this raises some fundamental uh, bidding process questions, some fundamental requirement questions. I would hope that GSA and Social Security will continue to work with us for some kind of a compromise of how we can, can work this through the buildings up. Oh, by the way, they didn't inform our office or the city that, they had, that the building was being built. So unless you happen to find some little obscure thing in a massive congressional record or hire a Beltway Bandit to look for it, they told us that they couldn't tell us that they were building this building because of homeland security concerns when you build a government building. Now, this is kind of uh, bizarre. I know the Oklahoma City bombing question and all this kind of thing, but it's not like this is a secret. It's standing there now. It's been in all the TV stations. It's sitting out outside the city. Uh, seniors are calling my office. Low-income people are calling my office, just like they did in the disability office. Now, I would like to be able to work with the chairman and the oversight committee because if indeed the law doesn't require it in a major metro area where bus access is, it should. Secondly, there needs to be a more open and transparent bidding process. We are getting flooded now with people who say, we have buildings in this area. We can meet the requirements. They didn't have any way of knowing that a bid was out unless they hire somebody from inside Washington to figure out between March 15th at 2 o'clock and March 17th at 5 o'clock. They don't know it's being built. It gives inside bidders an incredible opportunity, and then the few people who figure it out sometimes are inexperienced and don't have kind of know where the, the bidding uh, process is. So one guy keeps cleaning up and getting all these type of bids, and we're, once again, we're burned on the mass transit question. I wanted to raise those questions to you. Look forward to continuing to work with it, but I believe it's something substantive our committee ought to be looking at because seniors who can't drive, seniors who are uh, 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 or don't have a car, and they, they, they uh, need to have a, a relative or somebody get them there or a friend and if they can't use mass transit, this is just an unbelievable, discouraging thing to happen twice in my home area. Congressman, please give me an opportunity to work with your team and with the people in Fort Wayne. Let our regional folks uh, take a look at this. Um, if something is wrong, these are the kind of issues that I want to be here to try to resolve, to try to expedite the process, make it transparent and make um, hold us accountable for our actions. So please allow GSA an opportunity to respond back to you. I was not aware of this. I'll be looking into it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to make sure it's on the public record so nobody thinks she's doing it because I'm a, a Republican. <laughs> uh, would the gentleman yield? I yield my last 30 seconds. Thank you. And uh, uh, I, I would add to that that uh, I do think that the issues of, of national bundling uh, a lot of the other issues that this committee historically has worked on and the Committee on Small Business are, are also appropriate. appropriate. Uh, you know, being a Vassar graduate, I hope you'll appreciate as a Kent State graduate, I know an awful lot of small business people who, uh, who definitely would appreciate your having time to focus on that, and I appreciate your agreeing to do so. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Doan, when you testified here on March 28, I asked you uh, several times repeatedly, in fact, whether you, as the head of the agency, believe that the political presentation by the White House uh, at your offices was appropriate. I asked whether you thought it was proper use of taxpayer money uh, and federal government resources to be discussing uh, political tactics and political strategies for winning Republican congressional seats. Uh, every time I asked you the question, you refused to answer it, uh, stating that there was an ongoing investigation by the Office of Special <coughs> Counsel. I, I emphatically disagreed with your refusal to answer the question, uh, but nevertheless, the OSC investigation is now over, as you know, and I'd like an answer to my question. So today, uh, after you've examined the issue backwards and forwards, do you believe it's appropriate to gather together 
federal government officials on federal property during work hours to discuss how to help Republican candidates win congressional seats in future elections. Congressman Welsh, actually the Office of Special Counsel's investigation on the PowerPoint presentation is not concluded and they said so in the report and the letter they sent to the President. So, but what I can tell you is that while I won't Monday morning quarterback, what I have tried to do, especially given the concern of this committee, is take action. And one of the things I've done is I've initiated processes that's not my to that's fully not my question. review future w presentations. Ms. Stone, I've got oh. to reclaim my time. Oh, please do. I would appreciate it if you would answer my question. If you're going to refuse to answer it, you can tell me you're going to refuse to answer the question. But it's not helpful to me for you to answer a question that I didn't ask. So oh, I'm my sorry, question I was trying is, to correct a misstatement. You misstated when you said the investigation was closed on the presentation and it was not. So is it your ability now? Well, I have a, I have a letter here that was just handed me. Uh, it's the U.S. Office of Special Counsel dated June 8, stating that the Office of Special Counsel has completed its investigation into the Hatch Act allegations. No, they in completed the investigation into the uh, alleged statement, but later on in that, I don't know if the young lady has it, if you go a few more pages into it, they will actually say that they have not yet finished their investigation okay, into the me, PowerPoint presentation. I, it, it's kind of hard getting our questions answered when you spend a lot of t my time answering questions I didn't ask. Basically, the situation is this. With respect to the Hacks, Hatch Act investigation, the special counsel says that his investigation is over, but you say it's not. No, so let's, that's not what let's I just said, hold on a quick. Let me just ask this. Do you believe, or are you willing to answer now whether you believe that it's proper uh, to gather together federal government officials on federal property during work hours to discuss how to help Republican candidates win congressional seats in future elections. I will not Monday morning quarterback and I will not prejudge the Office of Special Counsel's decision in that matter. No, I'm asking I've you. I've just given you my straight answer. I'm, I'm not going to give you a, a, a yes or no, which is what you're trying to do. All right, so you, uh, Because Ms. I Dome. don't know. I'm not a legal person. I'm not a Hatch Act expert. That's, I but guess, why the, I'm here. You're the head of a governmental agency. So you don't have an and, opinion? And you didn't want my answer when I said, I am trying very hard. I've put in place processes to vet uh, any kind of presentation. And if the White House comes. called you up and said, we're sending over uh, our political, uh, Mr. Rove's coming over, great news. And he's got a great PowerPoint presentation and he can identify the 10 congressional candidates that your office can do the most for. Uh, let's have a nice lunch. Are you saying you would, I would say, say that come I would on over it, or no, you I would say, we put or in you, place say process. you can't come? I would say follow our process, send it to our ethics officer, and that ethics officer will review any person and any presentation who is coming to our agency because I'm focused on the mission and I just want to get our mission accomplished. So we have a process in place now. So, so you won't answer. Well, yeah, that the is the answer. We're going to send it to the process. You know, you're, uh, on June 1, uh, your attorney, one of your attorneys, uh, Mr. Nardotti, wrote a letter stating that the White House PowerPoint presentation on its face raises Hatch Act concerns. That's your attorney. General Nardotti, yes. Okay. Uh, I assume you agree with your attorney, is that That correct? was actually a statement of the open investigation, as I mentioned, that is ongoing right now by the Office of Special Counsel. Um, I think it says something like it may, well. Do you agree with your attorney? Yes, there is an open investigation right now on the PowerPoint no, presentation. No, no. <laughs> he said that the PowerPoint oh, presentation yeah. on its face raises Hatch Act mm -hmm. concerns. The question is very simple. Do you agree with that or not? I said yes, it's public knowledge that the Office of Special Counsel is looking into this matter. That's what the whole sentence says, if you read that in the letter. Mr. Nardotti. Regular order also gave an interview in which he Mr. stated Chairman, that the White House I'm demonstrated a lack of responsibility when it presented this briefing to you. Uh, let me ask you this. Do the you gentleman's agree? gentleman's time has expired. Uh, do you have a, an outstanding question you want to ask? Have you completed I do. your question? If Is I, the chairman I, yielding uh, the member additional time? 30 seconds. The gentleman's given an additional 30 seconds. Uh, do you agree with your counsel that the White House has demonstrated a lack of responsibility for this? I'll simply say the letter speaks for itself in its entirety. Gentleman's time has expired, uh, Mr. Issa. Thank you, and, and I'm going to use my time to uh, give you an opportunity to answer these questions. 
the way they should have been able to be answered. You know, ask a question. If there's a flaw in the question, you should be able to point out the flaw. And so let, let's start with, as I understand, the question that was asked by uh, a previous uh, interrogator had a flaw in it. Would you like to explain why that was a flaw so, that, so people understand that you were attempting not only answer, but to answer in a way that we would get the best understanding? Yes. There are the way the Office of the Special Counsel chose to pursue this is they investigated only an alleged statement, and that is what their report is discussing. There is a second investigation which is ongoing even as we speak into the PowerPoint presentation itself and its contents, and that has not been resolved. Okay. So if I can characterize the full truth here, uh, they have closed the investigation as to whether or not this one statement you made at the end of a briefing in which you spent a lot of time knowing that there were cookies there and, and, and working on your blackberries, uh, that in fact <coughs> that's, be, that's going to the President. That's going to be evaluated. It's at the President. It's at the President. And, and he'll make a decision about whether he or not. He will and I will live with it. And, and we all will live with it. That's the law. However, the, question of, uh, the underlying question that's alluded to here is whether or not the, the very public concept that apparently came out of some people involved with the President of, of putting these informative slideshows together and so on for candidates, whether that crossed the line or not, which is a legal question you're not able to answer, but that's still underway as far as you know. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, and, and, and we'll live with the decision there, too, I'm sure. Uh, the, uh, the other question that was cut off, uh, as I understand it, you have implemented a policy that is more than just a non-lawyer skilled businesswoman making a decision on something that you haven't seen but somebody's saying, I want to come over and present something. You, as I understand it, you've implemented a program where that presentation must be pre-screened by an ethics expert before it's given, no matter what the source. Is that correct? That's true, and it's for every office within GSA. Y you know what I find amazing is that here in Congress, both sides of the aisle, we caucus and talk about each other's. We, 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 say, we draw the line. We don't talk about fundraising, but we talk about how to defeat the other party and, and how to deal with candidates and who's vulnerable. We do that in conferences here all the time, and it's a little bit of hubris that one body can't do something without the other body pretending that we don't do what we do, uh, which is the activities that go on inside members' offices and even in conferences with 200 members uh, would amaze you. Did the gentleman uh, yield to me? Of course, Mr. Chairman. There's a very big distinction between political uh, candidates and people in Congress and even at the White House in the political office than the head of the General Services Agency, which is a very important non-political job, and the Hatch Act wouldn't apply to you. Of course, uh, you'd be violating the ethics vi uh, rules if you raised money in your office, but it wouldn't, viol wouldn't violate anything if you well, had a And reclaiming my vote. time, I, I, I not for a minute do I, do I pretend that there isn't a difference, but it is, it is sort of interesting that the very idea that Republicans might meet as Republicans uh, uh, is a little disingenuous to the public. The fact is our rules are different, and, and I know you're going to live with the outcome of the rules. But there are also rules for the Office of the Special Counsel or Inquisitor, Interrogator, or Prosecutor, as they've been more appropriately called today. Would it surprise you to know that the Special Counsel on April 26th uh, disparaged you? That, in fact, they said you had amnesia. And they did that before Mr. Waxman and his committee. Would that surprise you? That, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, we're actually before his committee staff. Uh, that would surprise you. Well, it would, doesn't surprise me because it happened. And so here you have the staff, these appointees, if you were, these employees that are supposed to be so unbiased, and they're coming before the bias committee, uh, committees, and, and they're disparaging you uh, prior to that time. Would it also surprise you to know that next week the Office of Special Counsel will be here asking Chairman Waxman for reauthorization? Yes, that would surprise me. Well, it's going to happen. And would it surprise you that a good showing of toughness might, in the back of the mind of the Special Counsel, somehow benefit that reauthorization? Would that surprise you? Don't speculate, please. Don't I'm speculate. Not, 
I'm Mr. trying chairman, to really some object experience. To, I really okay. object. I must object, Mr. Uh, 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 Mr. Chairman. I know that you are long suffering. Oh, wait a second. This is my time. Yeah, uh, but it may be, uh, but, uh, but I object to the t if they, if you could take down yeah. words, that's what I'd be doing. You have cast <laughs> aspersion on the chairman with no with no predicate of evidence okay. in doing General so. General Lady, uh, thank you for your Yeah, your and reclaiming support, the time the I would have had. The has uh, another few seconds uh, uh, yeah, in his I, time just, left. Yeah, just to answer, I was actually disparaging, if you will, the conduct of the special counsel in coming and disparaging this lady uh, before committee. I'm, I'm not for a minute believing that the chairman would look toward reauthorization based on on this preferential and, and unreasonable conduct that appears to have gone on by the special counsel. Well, uh, I trust the chairman will be fair in all things. I yield back. Boy, am I glad I gave you that extra time. <laughs> uh, whose turn is it now? Mr. Sarbanes, I think you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I hope my mother's watching. She's a Latin teacher, and I'm just going to take issue with your citing of the hortatory subjunctive. The, uh, the, the actual tense that was used in the statement about will not be getting promoted and so forth, that, that is just clearly the future tense. It's not future perfect or future pluperfect or anything of that nature. Actually, the best example of the use of hortatory subjunctive is the statement, how can we help our candidate? No. Because, yes, the hortatory no. subjunctive is used when you are exhorting people to do something, which is exactly what that statement was. That was an exhortation in the subjunctive tense, not using the word let's as it's usually seen, but using this other construction of how can we help our candidates. I just wanted to correct the record on that. We can debate it after if you'd we like. Must, um, I, I agree with um, Congressman Shays that you are truly a remarkable person. Um, I, I don't think I've ever seen a witness have this much fun um, or view the interchange with a committee as, as a sport in the way that you have. I, the lack of contrition and humility that you have displayed to me uh, and this committee is, is frankly truly breathtaking for me. But let me dispense with the introductory uh, remarks. I know. Um, let, me, let me ask you about the statement um, that allegedly was made, how can we help um, our candidates. Do you agree that if that statement had been made that it would have been a violation of the Hatch Act. I know you claim that you don't remember making no, it. No, I don't remember making it, but I have to tell you, I'm not sure I would be able to say a yes or no unless I understood the context. In fact, there's actually a long discussion from the Office of Special Counsel people in the testimony on that. Mm -hmm. It depends on what did it lead off with, what was happening in the middle. There's a whole lot of stuff going on there that I don't want to be involved Let me ask you another question. In. Your attorney um, indicated, I mean, a, appeared to agree initially in some testimony we have here that uh, that, that you don't rem you don't remember whether you said that or not but then later um, it's mr. Nar Mar Nardotti. general Nardotti yes said it appears that administrator Doan's alleged question at the end of the presentation was not directed to the GSA presidential appointees but to mr. Jennings so I'm confused. He, he appears to be conceding um, the statement, but just sort of disputing who it was addressed to. Yet in another place, he's agreeing with you that it didn't happen. So No, I think he, what he was trying to do is provide context of if you did this, it's X. If you did this, it might be Y. If you did this, the end, you know, end result might be Z. And since he's right there, you'd probably ought to Okay. Talk directly to him. Well, and context nuances, is but. very important. You've used the word context, uh, um, I think, hundreds of times in the course of this, and we're trying to get as much context as we possibly can. Let me ask you this: You you understand the Hatch Act clearly? I mean, if you didn't before the hearings, we all certainly understand it now. Um, and would you agree that there's different gradations of violation of the Hatch Act? I mean, there's there's degrees to which that uh, yes. a violation there can occur. There appears to be degrees. And that, 
if you looked at if you looked at sort of indirect political statements or activity occurring um, sort of down in the uh, in the rank and file level that 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 is a less egregious kind of violation of a hatch act than you might have if you were if you had a high level official engaged in more direct uh, sort of political exhortation would you would you agree with that? No, I wouldn't, because no. I would have to know more about all the scenarios surrounding it. As I said before, I'm not a hat check expert, although I have obviously read up on it as much as possible from in preparation for my stuff. But there's a lot that apparently goes into the decision making when the Merit Protection Board evaluates the hat check. So I don't even want to try to speculate, Congressman. The um, the statement. Some on the other side have, di have dismissed this statement as, you know, it's just one statement. It was one sentence. It was one remark. I'm assuming it happened. It was one remark. And, but in, in the suggestion being, you know, even if it happened, it was just a, it was a little thing and we're making this huge deal out of it. But it's, that's everything. That statement is everything, particularly if it's a statement made by a person who is as direct as you are. I mean, I don't see you, based on your testimony here today, uh, being a, a, a somebody who's, who's a wallflower at a meeting. I just can't imagine it. And so if you take the directness of your personality and you combine it with a statement, a very loaded statement like that, the combination of that, I think, is very plausibly a serious violation um, of the Hatch Act. And I notice you said here. Mr. Sarbanes, your time has I'm expired. Sorry, let, me, uh, let me just finish by noting that you said in your testimony, one of the best things about me is that I'm direct. Of course, that's probably also one of the worst things about me. In combination with that statement, I think it did have a terrible effect inside the agency. This is Thank a you, leap in logic. It's a leap in logic. Gentlemen's time has expired. Um, Ms. Stone, we, we have a very few more questions of members, but I, I think it would be appropriate to take a break for 10 minutes uh, Thanks. And, uh, and then we'll come back Mr. and Chairman, complete how, the hearing. How many, how many members are left? Yeah. All right, just curious, how many members uh, do we have yet left? I, am, I'm, I have my time. Who else has time? Yeah, um, Mr. Brayley, well, that's not pertinent. No, I'm just we're, asking. We're going to take a break and then we'll be glad to give you the information. The next uh, person to question the witness is Ms. Norton, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Stone, um, as you know, I've come to know you and it, it, certainly to admire you personally. Um, I know you in connection with my own jurisdiction over the GSA and e another. Excuse me, Congressman, I'm sorry, could you talk just a tad louder? Uh, as I, as I said when we had our last hearing, I've come to know you uh, uh, and to admire you personally. Uh, this out of our contact with you on my uh, jurisdiction uh, of my subcommittee and another committee. Um, if I didn't know how sophisticated uh, you were and that the administration had apparently acknowledge that it has done this with upwards of 20 agencies, I would think of you as a babe in the woods, uh, given what has been found. I, I'm, uh, and you, as you know, I believe everybody is accountable for her own actions, but I am uh, quite amazed that White House personnel would have put uh, any agency head in this position, um, even though they are they know or should have known uh, of, of how to behave and react. Uh, 
Ms. Dawn, this matter is here this time in a wholly different posture where findings have been made, where conclusions uh, have been drawn by an independent body, uh, at least one not connected with uh, us. Um, and I recall that at the last hearing you said that you would uh, live with um, the findings. You acknowledge that the Office of Special Counsel was independent and, and uh, impartial. Uh, are you still willing, given uh, what the office has found, found to live with, that is to accept its findings? The report, as I said, and the answer, just if I could just say right off the bat, is yes, there are two parts. There's his or the Office of Special Counsel's initial or final draft. I am allowed to comment on the draft. The two are put together and with a cover letter. We want to comment on the draft now. No, 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 no. The I'm matter saying is that your draft has been sent to the president. And, and we're done. There's nothing more to be said. And done is the, is, is the word for it. Now, and I'm we have asking to live you with the decision. A, a question, yes. and because <laughs> I'm held to my five minutes, mm -hmm. In light of what you said at the last hearing, mm -hmm. are you willing to live with the findings of the special counsel now that they have been made? I, I'm willing to live with the combination of the report, which is what I was talking about. I will live with the report, which is his findings and my comments to his findings and his recommendation to the so president. So you do not accept his findings then? This report this is This impartial, flawed. this, this, imp this, when, when you when you refuse to answer our questions before, oh, I'm sorry. you constantly refer to the impartial body that was considering this matter. It has now considered, it has now made findings, it has now made conclusions. Those were not the conclusions and findings of this committee. Uh, you said you would live with them. I'm asking you, are, uh, I, 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 are you willing to live with those findings as you told us you would? It is a flawed report and I accept that they are allowed to submit that report and I must live with it. But these are two different issues. Do you issues. accept that they are an impartial body not connected with this committee or with you or with anybody else of interest uh, or of imputed interest in this matter? I do not believe that this report was impartial. I do believe it was flawed. It cr omitted critical information. But whatever the findings are, I have decided you know, as I said in the last meeting, that I will live with the President's decision, the findings, the report has gone to the President, it is on his desk, whatever well, Ms. it Ms. is, Don't it I, is. Reclaiming my time, Yacht you've got to live with, we got, you've got to live with the President's ultimate decision, Yes, we obviously. all must do that. You are, of course, uh, contesting. So you're living with it, but contesting the no, impartial findings. No, no, I am not findings. contesting the President's decision. No, sorry. Uh -oh. You know, if you listen to my questions, oh, you wouldn't answer some other questions. Okay, I that's said you because I'm not interested in the president's findings because he hasn't issued them. You are contesting the findings and conclusions of the Im impartial body that you yourself said was independent and impartial. Is that not the case? Yes or no? Yes, it is because that is part of the process. The report has two parts. Mr. Uh, I don't Block's need you cover once again to take me to school that. on the report. Thank okay, you. But Mr. Block's cover letter explains the process and he tells you in the cover letter there are two parts to it, his findings and I am allowed to comment on it and it will not be and changed. And I have just said oh, that, okay. Ms. Doan. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. That, that you, were, you, you, you yourself had were allowed to, to make your own comments. Okay. Now let's talk about those the, the, yes, the, please. the, the comments. Um, the impartial and independent Office of Special Counsel use language that it seems to me anybody would take seriously. This is a body that looks at Hatch Act violations. Could imagine no greater violation of, of the Hatch Act um, pointed to using the machinery of an agency partisan for a partisan campaign uh, to retake the Congress and certain Governor's uh, man. The lady's time has expired. Uh, could, Did you could, could I just a ask the, the 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 question? Then is do you your your attorney call this report reckless and inflammatory, uh, overblown? Uh, do you believe that these findings uh, by the impartial uh, and independent special counsel are are, are inflammatory? and reckless, et cetera. I believe they're inflammatory, showing leaps in logic, totally unsubstantiated by the facts. And I think if you look at the sheer number of errors, I'm not going to say that Why some of them. Why do you think the special counsel went out of its way to Mr. be Chairman. reckless with you? Mr. Chairman. I don't know. That's the question. I really would love to have an answer to that. Mr. I Chairman. Don't know. The gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Chairman, may I take one minute? Uh, yes, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you. I mean, look, 
the, the OSC makes its finding. She makes her retort and the President makes the decision. That's the process. She's going to live with it. It's not complicated. We know what she thinks of the report because they wrote a 15 or page or odd rebuttal to that. So that's on the record. We don't need to waste our time going through that. But it's not just Mrs. Doan who takes exception to the report. Elaine Kaplan, by the way, a, I think, I believe a Democratic appointee who was Mr. Block's predecessor, has commented widely in the press that the harsh report raises a number of questions. She suggested uh, that the, her comments may be much more minor violations than Mr. Block is reporting. She adds that there are nuances here that have not been carefully explored. Uh, her comments may have been uh, given the employees to take action in their private capacity. It could have been construed that way, Some, a point I raised earlier. Uh, given that this was a group of political appointees, uh, such a statement would not be merely as, as harmful. The report glosses over the fact that each of the employees that attended the briefing was a presidential appointee rather than a civil servant, and thus the core concerns of the Hatch Act weren't implicated. Now, there are other issues that are raised, but it's not just her that's questioning the OSC's report. I just think the record should reflect that. Thomas, time has expired. The Chair is going to um, yield himself five minutes. Uh, the report has been concluded by the Office of Special Counsel, and the recommendation of the Office of Special Counsel is that you be given the maximum possible penalty for violating the Hatch Act, which would be a firing. Now, people could disagree with the report. They could disagree with the recommendations. The President will make his own decision. Ms. Stone, I, I want to ask you about just conflicting statements that you seem to be making quite frequently, and I'm using that present tense, but it's also past. When you testified before our committee at our March hearing, you repeatedly claimed you could not recall any information about the January 26, 2007 meeting or the White House political presentation, and you had absolutely no memory of asking GSA employees how they could help Republican candidates in upcoming elections. That's what you told us. And you, we questioned you over and over again. You remember there were cookies. You remember you came in late. You remember that some employees didn't attend. But beyond that, you told us you had no further information. Five, five weeks later, you testified before the Office of Special Counsel. And suddenly, you had a new and rich details about the meetings in your statements. According to your OSC testimony, um, you said you asked the White House presenter how can GSA help its cabinet liaison understand that the opening of the San Francisco Federal Building would be a perfect event for President Bush to attend? Did you say that to the Office of Special Counsel? Yes, I believe I did. You also told them that Mr. Jennings suggested you write a white paper or a one-pager explaining why it would be relevant for the President to attend. But you didn't tell that to our committee. Um, during your interview with the OSC, you testified you would refrain from providing this committee with full information about the meeting. You testified that you were advised not to engage in a, quote, substantive discussion, end quote, of the political briefing that you believed OSC investigators should have, quote, first dibs on this information. Uh, that makes it sound like when you told us you didn't recall, you were really holding back information. Uh, you did tell us under oath that you didn't remember, and then you told the special counsel under oath that you did remember, and you were even saving the information for him. Um, when you be here before this committee and you testify under oath, you're supposed to testify honestly and completely. That's an obligation that people have, and it's to be taken seriously. And I put that out there. Then the last time you testified before this committee, Several members expressed concern about the veracity of your responses. Uh, reading the report of the Office of Special Counsel, it looks like they shared that concern as well. You told the Office of Special Counsel that one of the many reasons you could not recall Mr. Jennings' PowerPoint presentation was that you were using your BlackBerry. Isn't that correct? Yes, it was. Okay. And then the Office of Special Counsel did something that I find a little surprising, but makes sense. They asked you to turn over your BlackBerry. And they looked at the documents to see whether it corroborated that you were using your BlackBerry. And um, they said that 
that you provided no documents to corroborate that you, quote, read, sent, composed, deleted, or moved any emails during that January 26, 2007 meeting. That was one of the critical omissions that I've mentioned throughout this hearing, uh, Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. That they, that they, they omitted to mention that there were 220 emails in my inbox. And as I said in my testimony, my, I think my direct statement was that I was reviewing uh, uh, emails during that time and looking up occasionally is what I actually said to okay. the OSC. Now, another allegation made against you was that after the White House presentation, you asked how to get a prominent Republican like Senator Martinez to attend a courthouse opening in Miami. When OSC asked you about this allegation, you said you don't believe there was ever a discussion of Miami at all at the meeting. Not at all, you said. But then we had 10 GSA officials testify under oath that they remembered the discussion of the Florida courthouse in your statement about getting Senator Martinez to attend the event. Um, well, there was also the question of, you said you didn't, you just you thanked Mr. Jennings when he got there and you left. But then others testified, including your own GSA liaison, that, um, that's J.B. Horton, that o he told OSC investigators you gave Mr. Jennings a tour of your office and even showed him artwork displayed there. You told Mr. Tierney that you didn't have control over any bonuses, so you couldn't retaliate. Uh, Mr. Yarmouth indicated you could give bonuses. You said you were pleased to know that. But I want to include in the record a, a memo from the White House on March 29, 2002. It says to clarify the political appointees are eligible for performance-based awards. And I ask you personally to review any awards proposed for political appointees. So you didn't know the statute. But you did presumably get this memo, so it seems to me that you remember things selectively. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman, there's a difference between a performance-based bonus, a spot award, an individual award, a group award, and an organization award. Um, I believe Congressman Yarmouth actually talked about um, spot awards in his uh, dialogue, but I think we'd have to check the record. But that was my understanding. He was talking about spot awards. Well, the testimony before the Office of Special Counsel is they will not get any of these promotions. They will not get any of these bonuses. Well, you knew you had some control over some of them, and those were the bonuses that it appears you weren't going to give them. I think what we talked about was one or two. I, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. I would like to, um, to mention one other thing, though, Congressman, and that is that in our hearing on the 28th, I believe a lot of the dialogue and the discussion centered around the presentation itself, and was that what I remembered? And Congressman Braley um, actually was uh, the person who was asking me those questions, and so I think we would need to look at which part of that we were talking about. Thank you. My, mem my memory is you looked very, you looked a little guilty, and you said, I, I, I just am embarrassed, but I can't remember any of these things. That's my memory. Uh, Mr. Shays, it's your time. I think my colleague has to leave and would like to yield time to, um, uh, is that true? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would yield time to uh, Ranking Member uh, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> Let me note the, the memorandum that you were supposed to get was a March 29th, as Mr. Waxman accurately stated, 2002 memo. You were not in the administration March 29th, 2002, were you? No, I was not. And in fact, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of memorandums that predate your coming there. Are you going to be, are you familiar with every one of them? No, but um, I, I have to say I do know that there are memos that are out about presidential appointees and their bonus, different types of bonuses, and it's important to distinguish the different types of bonuses when we're having these discussions. Instead of focusing on one sentence taken in a context that is disputable over nine hours of testimony, I'm going to just ask you to reiterate again under oath for the record, did you retaliate against anybody in terms of withholding bonuses? I did not. So that never happened? No, it did not. So, you know, why are we here? Um, the, I, I'm going to address the OSC report, which has been construed as objective and non-biased and everything else. The OSC report, the Office of Special Counsel report, fails to mention your testimony that you were distracted by other pressing events which could account for not remembering the briefing or alleged comment. Uh, it also notes that you were preoccupied, it does not note that you were uh, preoccupied with response to documents coming from this committee 
due to, uh, due to OMB uh, the afternoon of uh, January 26th. Now, they also wrongly state that you disparaged all employees interviewed by uh, this committee. Is that correct? That is not correct. I mean, you didn't wrongly disparage all employees, did you? I did not. That, that testified, that made a comment, that said that you, you had said something. In fact, as I read the record, you praised uh, the New England Regional Administrator, who was one of those interviewed by the committee. You testified, as I understand it, that he received one of the highest performance evaluations in the agency, and you stated that affirmatively. Is that correct? That's true. So you didn't disparage him? No. You didn't threaten him, did you? No. Uh, they failed to address the mitigating fact that Hatch Act concerns are less among a group of political appointees. They never mentioned that, did they? No, they did not. Report glosses over the fact that each of the employees <coughs> that attended the briefing was a presidential appointee rather than a career civil servant. So the core concerns of the Hatch Act, which were that administrations may be coming and try to intimidate federal employees into political activities, really for political appointees it's a different, different level. So that, is my understanding. You don't need to say anything. Um, my judgment on this report is that as an independent and nonpartisan federal agency, the OSC officials have an obligation to conduct themselves professionally. And if you l look at the preliminary report, it was even worse than the other report. There was a tone throughout that they were out to hang you. That's, that's my opinion. The report wrongly questions your credibility that you were not interested in the details of specific elections by imputing such an interest because of your political contributions. Uh, that was shocking to me. First of all, it's not unknown for cabinet appointees and high-level appointees to be not only members of the President's political parties, but oftentimes contributors or active workers. Uh, I mean, that is more or less the standard, not just with this administration, but with previous administrations uh, as well. I think they wrongly jumped to the conclusion that contributing money to political candidates equates to an interest in polls and esoteric topics such as micro-targeting. We got to that before. You have an interest philosophically in the party and being able to enhance it, and that goes back to the email that was introduced in the record by Mr. Cummings earlier. But that doesn't equate to an interest in polls and micro-targeting. Have you ever shown a great interest in that? No. Just because you buy a baseball a ticket to the baseball game doesn't mean you're a professional ball player. No. Just because I contribute to the party doesn't automatically make me a politician or a politico. And the report spends more than half a page on a, what I consider this is on uh, footnote eight, on a page on an irrelevant and disparaging footnote that doesn't change your underlying testimony that you simply don't remember making the comment. Um, I don't understand why they unnecessarily published information about your comments about former GSA employees and outed those employees. Do you have any idea why they do that? I do not. It is so very wrong because these people do not deserve to have their name bandied about in public, to have their performance ratings evaluated in public. It's, it's just very wrong. And it's hurtful to me that I even in any way uh, speculated that allowed this to happen. I, I just you regret having even speculated deeply, and I actually don't like the the congressman who said that I didn't show uh, contriteness. I, I feel terrible about this. I I apologize to my employee. This is horrible, horrible, and I just want their names not to be bandied about anymore. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Thank you, uh, Congressman Sarbanes was uh, critical of your lack of contrition and humility. In fact, I think he said he had never seen a witness so, show so little contrition or humility. Uh, coming from a member of Congress, uh, uh, we're not quite known for our s uh, showing contrition and humility. I, that was one mouthful. Um, Congress plays by its own rules. We exempt ourselves from laws we impose on the rest of the nation, the general public, and the executive branch. In fact, some members get in trouble when they leave Congress and go to the executive branch because they still play by the same rules and find out they can't. Uh, the public can't FOIA uh, my documents. My emails are not going to be public. Uh, so I don't think members of Congress should be beating our chests and talking about uh, the shame of other departments when we play by totally different rules. The special counsel document is a charge by a, a, a prosecutor. He's a special counsel, correct? It's a charge, isn't it? Yes. It's somewhat like an indictment. Yes. And my Democratic colleagues continually lecture me 
on when someone takes the fifth, I think they're guilty, and when someone's charged, I sometimes say, you know, I think they may be guilty. And they say, no, you're, you're, you're innocent until proven guilty. And in your case, before this committee, you're guilty until proven innocent. That's what we're seeing, and I'm seeing it on the other side of the aisle from people who continually lecture me about you're innocent until proven guilty. Now, there are two things that I think happened that shouldn't happen. A meeting shouldn't have happened. I thought it was January 2006 and that somehow you had been involved in helping someone in the last campaign. I find out this was January 26, 2007. And the second thing that shouldn't have happened in my judgment is uh, that a comment shouldn't have been made, how can we help our candidate? You're not sure if you made this. You may have made some statement like that. You may have given that impression. Who knows right now what that is? So, you know, those two things bother me. Uh, frankly, uh, I would have thought that you could have been reprimanded. You could have been told this is not what you do. I have things that I do in my office, and sometimes my staff say, boss, if you do this, uh, you're going to be breaking a law. And I say, well, we better not do it. And they stop it. They're entitled to shut down my office anytime they think we're doing something wrong. But in 20 years, you know, I have not suggested everything that should be right. Once in a while, I have to be corrected. So it seems to me the appropriate thing for dealing with you should have been simply to say, you know what? You made a mistake. It shouldn't happen. Don't happen to happen again. And you know what? Knowing your character and what I've seen, you would have said, thank you. It won't happen again. And yes, we will check with the ethics before we do anything because this is not like the businesses that I used to run. Now, one Democrat said, when we combine everything, it looks bad for you. I would change that when they twist everything. And, and I mean, no disrespect to the chairman, but the chairman said to you that you were threatening your employees and saying they will not get a bonus. You never said that. You never, ever said that. What you did say was an explanation to why you thought someone who got a rating of three would be uh, unhappy because they would not get a bonus. That is what you said. That's what the record needs to say. You never threaten your employees. Now, uh, it was an explanation of why some employees may not get. So I want to know, who have you retaliated against? No one. I'd like to know, what candidates have you helped as a result of this January 07 meeting? None. So no employee was retaliated against. No candidates were helped as a result of this meeting. And at one time, you were being chastised because you had a friend who you would have liked to have had a contract. It was for $20,000. Did that friend get the contract? No. So I have a very difficult time understanding why we have spent so much time. I don't, I don't disparage the committee for saying, let's look into it. But once you looked into it, my god, it seems to me we could have done some more important stuff. Congressman, it does seem to me that what happens is they're trying to take that slide or two that they were, was in that presentation and they're trying to say that something happened with some of those guys and that's just not how GSA works. Our, our, our priorities are determined by our customers. Well, let me just say something to you. That's, you've already been put on the record as saying that. I just wish that meeting never happened and you wish it never happened and uh, and had it not happened, we would have been a lot but better. But you off. ask her if she wishes it never happened. <laughs> well, do you wish the meeting never happened? <laughs> After the amount of time we spent on it, clearly. Of course. You know, but I, you know, I don't think you need to rip your clothes and cry and say, I have sinned, I have sinned, I have <clears> sinned. <throat> you know what? I just want to thank you for your service. I hope it doesn't discourage other people like you to get into this. And I will say this to you. I find it, and this is my own view, but I find it when an African-American happens to be a Republican, somehow she is treated differently by Congress. And unfairly The gentleman's so. time has expired. The gentlelady from uh, Washington, D.C., for one minute. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to clarify, because I think this is just an error that was made as a matter of law. The posture before us was, um, if the analogy is to be made, more in the nature of an indictment. That is not, no, that is not the word that can be put when there have been findings and conclusions by an independent body. Uh, the, 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 the most that can be said is maybe you're on appeal, but you're not even on appeal because all the president can do is to decide what, if any, punishment. If you were on appeal, he could turn around what had happened. So I, this was not an indictment, and it is very important that the record show what we have here. 
an impartial decision by an impartial body. Maybe you disagree with it, but there's no way in which the member who thought this was an indictment with something yet to be proved. Uh, as a matter of law, it is not, and I, I, I am a great admirer of the gentleman, but just as a matter of keeping our terms straight, because if this were an indictment, which is where we were in the last session, waiting for the special counsel, I could agree with you. But the special counsel has spoken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlelady's time is up. Uh, Mr. Bailey, five minutes for the last five minutes. Ms. Doan, I got the distinct impression from one of the comments that Mr. Micah addressed to you that you had an opportunity to meet with the Republican members of the committee before you testified today. Is that true? I offered to meet with all of the members of the committee of whether you were Democrat or Republican before that last meeting, and none of the Democratic folks chose to take me up on the offer, apparently. No, I'm talking about oh, your testimony here today. Did you meet with Republican members of the committee in anticipation of your testimony here today? Yes, I met with, con with, with Congressman Davis. Just Congressman Davis? Uh, no, there were a few other congressmen. I can answer that, Mr. Braley. We, we called her up and wanted to see her ahead of time before well, she came up I here. just wanted to clarify that for the record. Absolutely. I never got we do this routinely with witnesses, by I the way. I never got the opportunity or the invitation to meet with you before the last hearing. I could so meet with you tomorrow at any time you want, Congressman Braley. I would love to sit down with you and talk to you about what GSA is doing. Okay, let's talk about Mr. Burton's comment when he, he made the remark that this hearing was very amusing to him. Do you find this hearing very amusing? I'm sorry, did you say abusing? Very uh, amusing. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no, it, this is very a? serious. This is, this is my career, this is my reputation that's being impugned here, and this is people alleging that I'm maltreating employees and doing all sorts of shenanigans. This is not true. Yes, this is so very it serious. it is very serious. And when Mr. Davis asks a rhetorical question, why are we here, let me answer to you why I'm here. The U.S. Office of Special Counsel is an independent federal agency appointed by President Bush to investigate alleged Hatch Act violations. And last month, the Office of Special Counsel concluded that you broke the law during this January 26 meeting at GSA headquarters that we've been talking about. And in its conclusion that was forwarded on to President Bush, this is what the Office of Special Counsel wrote. Despite engaging in the most pernicious of political activity prohibited by the Hatch Act, Administrator Doan has shown no remorse and lacks an appreciation for the seriousness of her violation. This and is an example other, of why it's one flawed, of though. The other points that I want to ask you about is you have denied that you violated the Hatch Act during that meeting. I have said I do not believe I violated the Hatch Act during that meeting because I, I cannot remember exactly what I said, but. I don't believe that I violated that. I can't well, remember your, which congressman asked me. In your counsel's me. letter mm -hmm. to the Office of Special Counsel, your, your own attorney suggested that the real violation of the Hatch, Hatch Act occurred when Scott Jennings made the PowerPoint presentation. Were you aware of that? I am not Monday morning quarterbacking. I have well, told you that, Well, let me read to you what he Braley. wrote to the Office of Special Counsel. If anything, it was that briefing which OSC concedes Administrator Doan had no role in preparing or arranging that may have violated the Hatch Act. However, rather than focusing on the presentation, which on its face raises Hatch Act concerns, the OSC has aimed its ire at a single comment, the phrasing of which is disputed even among those who remember it being made at all. So when you talk about this ongoing investigation for potential Hatch Act violations, do you agree that the presentation of that PowerPoint slide to your employees on federal crime was a violation of the Hatch Act and the record should reflect the witness has been conferring with counsel and has just been handed a document? Thank you for making that clear, Congressman. The letter from my legal counsel that accompanied uh, was the response. Um, I believe if you review it in its entirety, it does speak for itself. Um, what I will also tell you is that I am not, I've said it before, I'm not a Hatch Act expert. The Office of Special Counsel has still said it has not made its determination. Congressman Braley, I don't know why you're trying to ask me to opine on this, especially well, given that opining has gotten me to this point here. Let me here. tell you why it's important. You have repeatedly stated that certain things occur before you received Hatch Act briefings and Hatch Act trainings. But there is no dispute that between the date you took over your job and the date of these Scott Jennings briefings we've been talking about, 
you did receive Hatch Act training and Hatch Act briefings. Isn't that true? I did. However, I did not know and what the content of the meeting or the presentation was going to be. When you testified just now that you didn't do anything to help your candidates, I want to go back to these slides that we talked about <laughs> last time, where there were 10 targeted Democratic House races and another slide that says 2008 GOP defense. And it lists Could people who are Republican members of Congress who could be targeted in the 2008 election. So when you, as the head of the agency, suggest how can we help our candidates, and they've seen this slide, can you understand how reasonable people could conclude that those political appointees may be feeling pressure to do something to help these candidates? No, I'm not engaged in partisan political activities, and I haven't directed anyone to do anything. The gentleman's time has expired. I want to make some closing comments, and Mr. Davis will be recognized to do the same thing. And I want to just give you my observation, Ms. Stone. Uh, the committee has now investigated multiple allegations against you in your first year, in your first year as GSA administrator, including the following, that you violated federal contracting rules by awarding a no-bid contract to your close personal friend, that you intervened in contract negotiations on behalf of Sun Microsystems, potentially costing taxpayers millions of dollars, that you violated the Hatch Act by encouraging federal employees to use government resources to help Republican congressional candidates, that you made false and misleading statements to this committee, to Senator Charles Grassley, to the Office of Special Counsel, to the press, that you disparaged the credibility and professional credentials of colleagues in retaliation for their cooperation with investigations into your actions. And this seems to be a pattern. You refuse to take any personal respons responsibilities, and you attack others for doing their jobs. When the GSA Inspector General concluded that you improperly awarded the no-bid contract to your friend, you said he was out to get you. You call him a terrorist, and you threaten to cut off his funding. When this committee investigated your intervention on behalf of Sun, you claimed our motives were partisan. When your colleagues at GSA testify that you asked them to help Republican candidates, you claimed they were poor performers with an ax to grind. And now that the special counsel has concluded that you violated the Hatch Act, you have accused them of bias. What I have not seen is any recognition that your own conduct might be the reason you're here today. And after reviewing this record, I see little evidence that you acknowledge your responsibility or do you have any remorse for your actions. I have no confidence that you've learned anything from the experience of this one year time at GSA. I have to say, this is my opinion, but it's unusual for me to ever call for the resignation of a federal official but in your case, I don't see any other course of action that will protect the interests of your agency and the federal taxpayer. No one can be an effective leader who has abused the trust of her employees and threatened to deny promotions and bonuses to employees for telling the truth. <laughs> and no one can be an effective leader who has lost the public's confidence politicizing the agency and violating the Federal Hatch Act. Yet that is exactly what you have done. I uh, give you my opinion, just as others have given you their opinion. It will be up to the President of the United States who appointed you to decide what to do with the recommendation by this uh, Office of Special Counsel that recommends the President uh, remove you from this office. I would urge you to resign. Mr. Davis, any comments you want to make to close? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, the Office of Special Counsel simply makes uh, a complaint uh, they are allowed to respond to it, and the President makes his decision. And uh, you are trying to interject this committee and this Congress in what is an administrative review, which is your right as the Chairman uh, to do this. But I think I draw completely different conclusions, uh, conclusions uh, Mr. Waxman. First of all, uh, Ms. Doan, let me just say thank you on the networks contract. That is out there. That will save the Federal Government literally billions of dollars uh, over the next uh, decade. I, I think uh, this is the most uh, proactive and far-reaching telecommunications contract that, that we have ever had. And I particularly uh, appreciate your intervention with the Treasury uh, trying to go their own way on this and trying to keep all the government interconnected 
This is one of the things we have been preaching at this committee for years. It would not have happened without your active intervention. Um, uh, previous uh, holders of your position would sit back there in the bureaucracy and get picked to death by other uh, agencies. I want to congratulate you for the Federal Acquisition System, the merging of the FTS and the Federal Supply System. This, again, will save the taxpayers billions of dollars over the next uh, few years, where we can now put uh, technology, goods, services all under one contracting vehicle instead of having to go separate vehicles. Uh, this will allow us to get the best value for the taxpayer dollars. Ultimately, this committee should be concerned about making sure that when taxpayers pay their dollars uh, that they are getting the best value for those dollars. This committee is basically the intersection of three committees. One was the old Gover uh, Government Operations Committee, which was melded together from a number of different committees back in the 1950s that were used to oversee Federal expenditures and try to make sure that Government dollars were being spent correctly. Uh, I don't think this hearing and these hearings have gone anywhere in terms of furthering that purpose. Then you had the old Post Office and Civil Service Committee and the District of Columbia Committee that were merged together in uh, 1995. Uh, I know what politics is. I know there is a lot of pent-up frustration on the other side uh, about the inability of Republican Congresses to look at Republican administrations. Uh, but I think this is a bridge too far. Uh, I think they have beaten a dead horse, uh, that they have taken a few facts, cobbled them together, and I think you have held up well today in the testimony, putting them in an appropriate perspective. Um, it is not always pretty. Uh, but nine hours of uh, testimony under oath uh, by a very uh, a accusing uh, a prosecutor, in this case the Office of Special Counsel, uh, you are going to get statements sometime that in retrospect you might have answered them a little bit differently. But I don't find any uh, problem here with uh, any uh, kind of perjury, uh, any kind of uh, bullying witnesses or uh, retaliation. In fact, the evidence here I think suggests there was no retaliation. Uh, no one can show any retaliation. They can show some statements that might have said you were going to retaliate, but no, no retaliation. And, by the way, no overt political activity from your agency that furthered Republican candidacies. Uh, no actions on that. Just a statement about how can, uh, by others, they, by the way, didn't interview everybody that was there. And conflicting statements among the people they did interview over exactly what you did say if you read it very carefully. Some said you invoked GSA's name, others said you didn't do that. You just said, how could we help the candidates? Uh, and as you look at this, these were all in response to uh, leading uh, questions. But I guess most importantly, what we have to ask and what the American public has to ask is why are we this week, with everything else going on, holding this hearing at this time when we have serious immigration issues? And we ought to be looking at how we can close our borders, why we have gasoline shortages, how children in foster care systems end up continuing to be abused, why does it cost so much to adopt, why is it hard for American businesses to hire qualified students from other countries, how can we improve the security clearance backlog that is costing us hundreds of millions of dollars and the process breakdowns, why haven't we examined first responder interoperability closer, uh, what is the plan to ensure census accuracy? what oversight errors uh, we have seen in military pay, are they better off? No. A number of other issues that, in my judgment, we would deem much more important. Uh, ultimately, the American public will judge. It is interesting to note that uh, the Los Angeles Times yesterday, uh, for the first time, uh, published a poll giving this Congress ratings. And because of the overabuses that we are seeing now, uh, finding out that Congress is lower than the President and the lowest that it has been uh, in years, that, in fact, the new Congress uh, with a, a number of other abuses going on uh, with uh, when we walked through this last night on the floor of the House uh, over earmarks and the like is no different from before and in some ways just has a vengeance for partisanship. This hearing, I think, is evidence of that. I have a very high regard for my chairman. I want to just say this. We have worked a lot of tough issues together. We happen to disagree uh, on, on uh, GSA and your role in this. I look forward to working with him on a number of other issues. Uh, but I think this isn't uh, an accuser, this is an abuser in this case, and they have overplayed their hand. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. That uh, concludes our hearing. We thank you very much for being here.
Now President Bush at an annual fundraising dinner for congratulations.